It's Chris Berman. All right, Gary, thank you. Welcome to Pro Players Stadium for the first postseason game ever for the Florida Marlins against the team that wasn't supposed to be here, the San Francisco Giants. The Marlins banked on Jim Leland to lead them to the playoffs. Moises Alou came south from Montreal. Bobby Bonilla rolled in from Baltimore. Alex Fernandez came home from the Midwest to bolster a staff already shining with Kevin Brown, all throwing to baseball's best kept secret, Charles Johnson, waiting for their biggest gun. Back it goes to Lurk. Back, back, back. This game is over. Postseason, Barry Bonds and company were told no way. But Jeff Kent and the new look Giants forged to the top. It must be dusty until the lead evaporated in mid-September. Two back of the hated Dodgers. A win on a first inning homer was topped by Brian Johnson's 12th inning homer against L.A. the next day. Saturday, the Giants were back in the postseason for the first time since 89. Will Bonds pay dividends this October? Welcome to South Florida for the first, the first ever postseason game in Marlins history. They represent the National League wild card and they go up against the champs of the National League West, the San Francisco Giants. Hello once again everybody, I'm Chris Berman along with Ray Knight. So glad to be bringing you postseason baseball for our second year here on ESPN. Well, I don't want to say these teams, the Marlins and Giants, are mirror images of each other, but... They both excel in winning at their last at bats, winning one and two run games and coming from behind. I anticipate every game in this series just about to go down to the wire to be, well, almost like my fingernails are, <laughs> nail biting time. Do you? I do too, Chris. I think it's two well-matched ball clubs. I do like the Marlins a little bit better. I really like their bench. Uh, I like their starting pitching better. Offensively, I think they have a little bit more depth. I really like the Giants' bullpen, uh, and today's game, I think, is going to be really indicative of what the series is going to be like, a very low-scoring contest with two outstanding pitchers. Well, low-scoring because Kevin Brown, I mean, the Giants have been scratching their head. They have not touched him since he's come over to the Marlins in the National League. Not touch? Yeah, on June 10th at 3 Com Park at Candlestick Point, only a hit batter, Marvin Bernard, stood between Brown and a perfect game. As it was, he authored the second no-hitter in Marlins history. He is 4-0 lifetime against the Giants with an ERA of just over a half a run are the giants psyched out a little bit ray to face a guy like kevin brown can they undo their problems against him well they may be able to undo their problems i remember mike scott in 1986 mm -hmm. uh he had us thinking very negatively and we didn't want to get to him in game seven i know that uh, barry bonds today in his interview didn't seem very confident uh he's what one for 25 or something but uh they've had a tough time the giants against him and and uh, they haven't figured him out and i don't know that they will figure him out because he's very nasty so the pressure perhaps on kirk reader to keep this thing darn close he pitched very well in a September game here in Florida that the Giants won one nothing, Is it time for the big stars to shine? That would mean Mr. Sheffield and Mr. Bonds. We'll be back in a moment. ESPN's presentation of the 1997 Division Series is brought to you by the Fannie Mae Foundation, showing America a new way home. By VFW, we do anything for this country. And by Isuzu, builders of the completely reinvented 1998 Isuzu Rodeo. Go farther. It is South Florida, and it is still late September, which means the threat, and you can see the ominous clouds, the threat of late afternoon thunder showers, and the fans have their slickers. But it never rains on Dave Campbell's parade. Dave working with us here in Florida for these two games. And, Davey, I know you got your eyes on lots of things in this series. Well, Chris, in the ESPN Spotlight today, we're going to try to take some snippets of inside baseball. It might be good or bad base running. It could be defensive positioning. The effect of Charles Johnson, the great Florida catcher on the game. But the beauty of baseball is we really never know where we're going to go until we get there. But we'll try to bring it inside when we see something. All right, Soup, lots to look at. And the fans, they're hoping to get a, a sellout here. Uh, they see 41-plus for baseball. Maybe they can hammer 45,000 in here for the first ever postseason game. Our Pepsi lineup for Dusty Baker's San Francisco Giants. 
Darrell Hamilton leads off in center field. Bill Miller, who led the team in batting average, hit second at third base. Barry U.S. Bond, seven homers in his last 11 games to give him 40 for the year, hits third. J.T. Snow, much more powerful from the left side of the plate than the right side of the plate, is cleanup. Jeff Kent, maybe the team's MVP, is second base, hitting fifth. Stan Javier, very good with the glove and right, hitting sixth. Jose Vizcaino at shortstop is seventh. Brian Johnson, a big September hero, eighth. Kirk Reeder hitting ninth against the right-hander, who's been untouchable as far as the Giants are concerned, Kevin Brown. Oh, he certainly has. One of the best pitchers in all the game and great sinker. You're going to see a lot of ground balls today. You're going to see a slider, and you're going to see a changeup. He elevates his fastball when he needs to, especially the left-handed hitters, and throws a lot of strikes. 205 strikeouts in 237-plus innings. That's really a little higher than his norm for strikeouts. And we told you at the beginning of the program, as Daryl Hamilton is in, that they have just scratched their heads in their five attempts at hitting Kevin Brown. Kevin Brown against the San Francisco Giants. And remember, he's just been in the National League for two years with the Florida Marlins. And there's Daryl's number. The free agent signee came over from Texas where he was on an AL West winning club last year for the Rangers. Daryl, Kevin Brown, 44 innings pitched. Three earned runs allowed in San Francisco. Ray, that's pretty impressive. That's very impressive. Two Harper to Bonilla. From his knees, he lays it across the Conine. And there is one on. It gives us a chance to perhaps look at the defense. And Jimmy Leland figuring a lot of ground balls today as it's starting to rain here in Miami. Well, Chris, if you mentioned before, there's going to be a lot of ground balls. And there you see uh, Bonilla, Renteria, Council, Conine on the infield. Sheffield, White, Alou in the outfield. Uh, Charles Johnson, probably the best catcher to come along since Johnny Bench as far as receiving the ball and throwing pitchers out, uh, runners out. Pretty high praise, and of course he's broken all sorts of records, which we will detail. Billy Miller swinging at the first pitch and fouls it away down the left field side. Miller in pretty much a platoon with Mark Lewis at third base for the Giants. Has been swinging a hot bat here late. He's the lefty, Lewis the righty. We expect to see Lewis in the lineup tomorrow against the left-handed pitcher Al Leiter you may see both Miller and Lewis in the line working the plate today is Mark Hirschbeck Gary Darling is at first base Tom Hallian at second Dana DeMuth is at third my neighbor from Cheshire Connecticut Terry Tate is in left field and Brian Gorman the umpire down the right field line in there for a strike it's one and two to Bill Miller with bonds on deck you can see the raindrops on his helmet and does this help a sinker ball pitcher Kevin Brown pitching a little slot ray, or does it not make a difference? Is Miller up the middle? Edgar Renteria is there. The Conine, two ground ball outs, two down. I don't think it makes a difference as far as the pitcher. It makes a difference as far as the infielders handling the ball. Uh, one of the toughest things for me to do was try to throw a ball that was wet and grip it, and it could play havoc on infielders as many ground balls as he throws. In the postseason for the first time since he played for Jim Leland's Pittsburgh Pirates in 1992 is Barry Bonds. Barry with a late tear in the last couple of weeks. Hit homers in each of those Giants big wins against the Dodgers and didn't stop. Swings at the first pitch. Looks like uh, Sheffield got fooled for a moment, but he makes the play. Bonds is gone. Three up, three down. Business as usual for Kevin Brown against the Giants. Back to South Florida in a moment. Kevin Brown did his job at the top of the first, and now Jim Leland is hoping that his batters can do their job in the bottom of the first inning here at Pro Players Stadium. Jimmy Leland, first-year skipper of the Florida Marlins, has them in the postseason, something he did three straight years with the Pittsburgh Pirates in 90, 91, and 92. Here's our Pepsi lineup for the Marlins today. Devon White, great postseason performer with the Toronto Blue Jays, is in center field and will lead off. Edgar Renneria, the young shortstop, is second. Gary Sheffield had a very strong September coming on, hitting third and right field. Bobby Bonilla hitting cleanup at third base. Moises Alou is uh, the left fielder hitting fifth. Jeff Conine, the barbarian, first baseman hitting sixth. Charles Johnson, the catcher hitting seventh. Craig Council, midseason pickup from Colorado at second base hitting eighth. Kevin Brown batting ninth against the left-handed starter from Hoylton, Illinois, Kirk Reeder. Reeder throws a little bit differently than Kevin Brown. Obviously, he's kind of a classic lefty, isn't he, Rick? He is. Not very much fastball, about 88 on his fastball. The ball moves away a lot from right-handed hitters. 
uh, left-handed hitters, in fact, hitting better than right-handed hitters do. Uh, he's got a big, slow breaking ball and a changeup that's kind of a dead fish. Dead fish against the Marlins. That ought to work. Oh, man. Hey. And what I mean by dead fish is just a changeup that just drops out of the strike zone down and away. Well, trying to hit that dead fish in the rain is Devon White trying to catch it in the rain. Oh, Jeff Kent with a nice over-the-shoulder grab, and there's one up, one down for Florida here in the first. Defense here, uh, J.T. Snow, probably the best defensive first baseman in, in the National League now. A lot of people have talked about, that have seen him a lot, thinks he reminds them of the great Keith Hernandez. There you see Kent, Viscayano, Mueller running out the infield. Giants probably have their best defensive outfield as Edgar Renteria looks at strike one from Reeder on the outside corner. But Stan Javi are very sure with the glove and right, and Daryl Hamilton, who doesn't have blazing speed, but, but really sees the ball well and gets good jumps on it in center field. And, of course, Barry Bonds has won gold gloves in left field. So this, of all his combinations, is the best defensive outfield that Dusty Baker could choose. Yeah, I think so. And I think behind a pitcher like Reeder, you have to have your best defense out there. He's not going to miss a lot of bats. He doesn't strike a lot of people out. People make contact. He tries to take sting out of the bat and, and keep people from hitting the ball hard. One thing Reader will do as you watch the foul off by Renneria is work quickly. Kirk Reader, I know Sean Estes made the all-star team and rightly he should and was a 19-game winner, but down the stretch, Reader was the Giants' best pitcher. He won that game that we did a couple of weeks ago, 2-1, against Los Angeles. Giants don't win that game. They're not here. In September, he's 4-0. As you can see, and misses with that one, two and two. And Reader in August and September combined to six and one. Although he surrenders more hits than any pitch, he certainly will not overpower you. Does Florida look for a certain pitch from Reader, Ray? I think you have to look for a pitch away with him. He's got a big breaking ball that ends up down around your shoe tops. He's got the real good changeup. Here you see a changeup coming here. Down the right field line. This one could be trouble. Just foul by about three feet. As Maxwell Smart would say, missed it by that much. But getting back to that thought, Chris, I, I believe this man likes to throw the ball in a lot with that breaking ball. And what you do is you dribble a lot of balls foul. The way to get him is shoot him to right field, look for the ball out over the plate and a little bit up. And you can drive some balls to right field. If you try to pull him, you're going to hit his breaking ball foul and miss his changeup. Payoff pitch coming again from Reeder to Renteria. Got him inside. Strikes him out. Two down in the Marlins first. Well, that's just a, just, just a situation where he set him up with the breaking ball and threw a fastball away, then came back and pounded him inside. See right there where Johnson set up inside? And he just has can't get to the ball. You see how Lady reacts with his hands? Didn't even try to inside out that ball. Just a great uh, exhibition of pitching, and that's what you're going to see from Kurt Reeder today. Moving the ball in and out, in and out, changing speeds. That'll bring up Gary Sheffield, whose average came up to 250 at the end of the season with a month in which he hit well, about 100 points higher than he did for the first five months of the year, hitting over 320 in the month of September, hitting five of his 21 home runs, including that home run you saw in the open that won that game in the bottom of the ninth against the Baltimore Orioles. So there, you know, if Gary Sheffield gets going here in this week and weeks to come if the Marlins go on, they become an infinitely better ball club, don't they? Oh, they are. This, this guy right here, I think, with Barry Bonds, have the two fastest bats in, uh, in all the National League. You better not try to challenge him with fastballs in. They'll wear you out. He didn't have the kind of year that most people expected him to have uh, because of the strength behind him in the lineup, but I still think that he's one of the most dangerous hitters in the game. Well, he went reaching on that pitch from Reader. It's two and two with two out and nobody on bottom of the first. Here's the off-speed pitch. Uh, this is that changeup that just, uh, actually, that's a breaking ball. Uh, that's that curveball that's going down and away. I thought that he released it with a changeup, but you see him get over the top of the ball, and it was a breaking ball. Trying to work him outside. Misses. Count is full. Yeah, you don't want to come inside on him unless you way inside. We tried to pitch him away off the plate and then try to bust him inside. But if you don't get way in there, there's a ball. 
He, he got way in there and it was a ball and the Marlins have the first base runner of the afternoon. And Sheffield who was way up there with Bonds and walks draws a base on ball. And that's a pretty close pitch right there. I think Sheffield moving his shuffling his feet back uh, gave you a little different appearance but that ball didn't miss by much. Bobby Bonilla hitting cleanup for these Florida Marlins 17 home runs 96 RBIs and most of his homers came in the second half remember he was among the league leaders in batters for about the first two or three months with like two home runs people are saying what's wrong with the power that came on and now made a very solid season for Jim Leland and he was happy to be reunited with his old skipper well Bobby's always been a line drive hitter his home runs are generally line drives especially right handed left handed he gets a little bit more lift. But I've never thought of him as really a home run hitter, although he's big and strong. Uh, he hits a lot of doubles, and, and he's really a, about a 23, 24 home run guy, uh, Max. If he has a big, big year, he may hit 30. Ooh, the reader gave him a fastball, but he wasn't really expecting it and missed it. 0 and 1. Bobby, of his uh, 17 home runs, six, only six came from the right side of the plate. Of course, he had much fewer at bats from the right side of the plate, but. Against three lefty starters of the Giants, he'll have plenty in this series. Off-speed drill to left field. Bonds collects to play it off the wall. Sheffield to third. Bernier in with a single. Runners at the corners with two outs. He was hammering that ball. Oh, he can hammer. He just dead fastball hitter when the count is in his favor. Sits on the breaking ball a lot when he's behind in the count. And as I said, a, a pure line drive hitter. You can't hit the ball any harder than this pitch. Just a breaking ball that kind of hangs out over the plate, but down Bobby stays with it with his head right on the baseball, and that's what we call a frozen rope. And with the way the grass is, if any thought of Bonds cutting off the ball, which perhaps on a dry field, he might have been able to keep Sheffield at second base. He elected to let it scoot off the wall because he didn't want to turn this into an extra base hit. So Sheffield is at third base. Benia is at first. And Moise is a little one-time teammate of Kirk Reeder in Montreal. Will step up and reaches out for an off-speed pitch. Hamilton looks in the raindrops, squeezes it, and Reeder wriggles free. The Marlins get a pair on, but strand them both. We've played one in uh, Drizzly, Florida. The drizzle continues here in South Florida. No score between the Giants and Marlins. Top of the second. We had a 2-1 to one game in Atlanta, which Greg Maddox went the route and defeated Daryl Kyle and the Astros. So the Braves get the first win of this postseason, beating the Astros 2-1. to one. And now here are the Giants and the Marlins as the National League gets set. Their two first results done before the American League starts tonight. J.T. Snow with career highs of 28 homers, 104 RBIs. Much more powerful hitter from the left side of the plate of all those home runs by JT. 27 of the 28 came as a lefty. He's behind Kevin Brown 0 2, and he told us before the game, Ray, he's looking to go away. If you try and pull Kevin Brown, he says you're not going to be able to do it. Well, he has a pretty good idea. He hit 368 against Kevin during the season and didn't do a lot of damage, but he certainly was able to get some base hits off of him, which not a lot of people did. Brown tries him inside, misses, and the count is back to two and two. Always with a smile on his face, and you talked about his glove work. <laughs> Strike three is rung up by Mark Hirschbeck. Well, we're only in the top of the second inning, but obviously lots for soup to keep track of. Dave, what do you got? Well, Chris, when Kevin Brown's throwing more ground balls than any pitcher the last three years, you've got to have great defense. Edgar Renteria, only eight errors since early May, has a great first step, gets to this ball. Watch the beautiful hands as he brings the ball into him on loads. He is their best defender after Charles Johnson, and he is important to guys like Kevin Brown. Well, I certainly agree with him right there, Chris. Uh, Supi, he, he's as good a shortstop as I've seen. Great range, like you mentioned. You talk about Ordonez. I don't think anybody in the National League or the American League has better range than Edgar Renteria. No, he's just a kid. I mean, you got to remember that he's just turned 22, young man from Columbia. This is Jeff Kent. Broken bat chopper to Jeff Kona, and he likes to keep it himself. And so five up, five down thus far for the Giants. 
Well, he's just so nasty. He freezes JT Snow on a fastball that starts at him and moves back over the plate. And there, starts with a fastball over the plate, moving in on the hands. Watch the movement of this fastball here. He's setting up away Charles Johnson, and the ball just runs right back on his hands. And you can see Jeff Kent just pinch his arms inside, trying to get the bat barrel to that ball. So that'll bring up Stan Javier. And he swings at the first pitch and breaks his back. So not only is Brown handcuffing the Giants, he's costing them money because they're going to get new backs. <laughs> <laughs> We're heading to the bottom of the second inning. Kevin Brown has been perfect. No score, bottom of the second inning. Chris Berman along with Ray Knight. So glad you could be with us for our doubleheader here. Opening day of the postseason in baseball. Tomorrow we continue. We begin with baseball tonight at 12.30 Eastern time. And then again, 1 o'clock, the Strohs and Braves. Tommy Glavin uh, trying to get the Braves up 2-0 against Mike Hampton of the Strohs. Sean Estes, 19-game winner, goes for the Giants against Al Leiter of the Marlins. That's 4 o'clock tomorrow, so the same lineup tomorrow. Then on Thursday, we have the Orioles at the Mariners. Well, excuse me, that's on NBC tomorrow night. 8 o'clock Eastern, 5 o'clock West Coast, the Orioles at the Mariners, Musina and Johnson, and won't that place be jumping tomorrow night in the Kingdom? And then, of course, uh, baseball tonight at midnight. So we're all over. If you want to know baseball, you come here, and occasionally there's a couple games with our friends at NBC and Fox. Two afternoon games today, two afternoon games tomorrow. Afternoon game on Thursday at 4 o'clock, afternoon game on Friday at 4, so just keep it here. This is Jeff Conine, one of two Marlins that was here at the start, two position players here at the start, along with Alex Arias. Hey. Conine fouls it back. So he, he's very excited, and he's also been platooned with Darren Dalton, lefty-righty, but with the Giants going Reeder, Estes, Alvarez, three lefties, Jim Leland indicated that Conine would probably start all three games. Well, there's Darren Dalton there who's been a great addition to this ball club and Chris uh, Conine has been a tremendous player here for the Marlins probably the best player uh, and he's just shown you what type of manager Jimmy Leland is how he can get his players to accept their responsibilities Jimmy there probably the best in the business at relating to players and getting them playing together as a team. Count is two and two to Conine, the leadoff man here in the second inning. Conine, Charles Johnson, and Craig Council. Little chopper wide of third base, fielded by Rich Donnelly. Rich Donnelly, the third base coach. Tommy Sant, the first base coach. Been with Leland through the glory days at Pittsburgh. Followed him here to Florida. So this is, uh, they say, hey, we're really northern guys. We're not really South Florida guys here yet. Fly ball to center. Hamilton with a late jump, and it's Javier in right center that makes the play in this one out. Or right, with the rain here, Ray, how about the batters? I mean, it's not a downpour. How about the batters? Does it, except for maybe your grip, does it hurt your concentration? No, it, it didn't ever bother me, except at Candlestick when the wind blew and it would just sprinkle a little bit of that mist. Uh, because it would make your eyes water as long as the thing that bothers you is wind. Uh, rain doesn't bother you very much. You've got that stick em over there and you're able to grip the bat. Charles Johnson, little comebacker that Reeder will handle and flip to J.T. Snow and there's two down in the Marlins second inning. But what you can see here, you can see everybody's really keyed up. Almost everybody's swinging at the first pitch. One way to beat Kurt Reeder is you have to take him deep in the count. You can't go up there swinging at the first pitch because he's not going to give you a pitch to hit until you make him throw strikes. He's going to throw you the changeups, the breaking balls. Doesn't throw a lot of fastballs. So, you know, you have to wait and get a good ball to hit. And uh, right now the Marlins aren't doing that except for Benita. This is Craig Council, and I'll tell you, the two general managers, Dave Dombrowski for these Marlins, fastball high, and Brian Sabian of the Giants, all the moves they made, and of course some of Dombrowski's moves a little bit different than Sabian's because he had the big bankroll and got the big free agent players. But of all the moves they've made, and there is Dave, and a great job he's done here in Florida, picking up Craig Council from the Rockies system, and Brian Sabian's picking up his starting catcher in July in a trade no one noticed, Brian Johnson, those two moves are as big potentially as any other moves that they have made. Well, it's like putting a piece of puzzle together, a puzzle together. 
Until you have the final piece, you don't have a complete ball club. And those two men have made these clubs complete ball club. Reader behind the number eight hitter, Council, three and one. Council is injury prone in the Rockies system. And they just kind of took a flyer on him. And there's a strike at three and two. They, they just picked him up in the middle of the season. They traded Mark Hutton just before the end of July, the pitcher, to Colorado. And I don't think they quite knew really that they would get their starting second baseman. And Council is really impressed, although the last few weeks he slowed down a little bit uh, at the plate. But he played on a championship club in the Pacific Coast League with the Colorado Springs Sky Sox in 95. But he had shin stress muscle last year in 96. He broke a bone in his foot in 94. He's really an unknown. And he's become the third base runner for the Marlins here against Kirk Reeder. But that's the reason that Jimmy Leland likes him. He does a little things. He bunts, he hit and run, he plays a solid second base, and there he worked Reeder for, for a walk, the second walk. Uh, Reeder has given up after Sheffield's walk in the first inning. That'll bring up Kevin Brown, of course, as a Texas Ranger in Baltimore Oriole, didn't do any hitting. But that's a huge at bat for Council, because what you do now is you get the pitcher to the plate, and even if he makes an out, you start the next inning at the mm -hmm. top of your lineup. Council aboard, Kevin, a lifetime 118 hitter, who tries to bunt his way on with two out, going one. James Kevin Brown, Macon, Georgia, 6'4", 200 pounds. Is the fourth overall pick in the 1986 draft, way back when, in Texas. Raider misses, ball one. He's a little bit slower here. It's almost as if he's lost his concentration just a tad with that walk to council. Off-speed pitch, one and two. Well, he tends to be a picker. I mentioned before about guys that try to move the ball around. Reeder, just to give you an example, has walked almost five and a half runners per nine inning. But he just rung up his opposite, Kevin Brown. So we've played two here at Pro Player Stadium. The Giants and Marlins. Nothing. ESPN's presentation of the 1997 Division Series is brought to you by Joe Ball, the hottest game on earth. It's in Fuego. And by the Delta Faucet Company. Delta, the faucet. Time of the third. No score between the Giants and Marlins. Grounds crew, a little extra sand work as we've had a little bit of rain here for a couple innings, but it certainly doesn't uh, deter the president of the National League from... Taking a front row seat right out in the elements. Kevin Brown now go throwing his watch. There's the very well respected Ray. Leonard Coleman, president of the National League. So you, you, you know he's in Florida. It's raining. He's got the Bowie Kuhn autograph raincoat on, but he's got the shades working anyway. Yes, he does. <laughs> uh, just so you said it, well respected man. Very, very fair. Very strong man. He, he just tries to do the right thing. Find me a couple times this year uh, for getting thrown out of games, but uh, actually wrote me letters and... Uh, uh, just a fine, fine man and, and would be my choice for commissioner. Well, I think he has respect of, of everyone, the players, the owners, and I know the umpire. He, he's, he's done a great job, and he's, he's here with us here in Pro Player Stadium. Well, unfortunately, so is the rain, although it seems to have slackened a little bit. But extra sand working on the mound. A veteran pitcher like Kevin Brown, who will now face 7-8-9. Jose Vizcaino, Brian Johnson, and Kirk Reeder. Is he concerned about his landing point here, or he's pitching these situations enough? I think he's pitched here enough. You've pitched in Florida, you've pitched in rain. Well, they try not to start very many games at this time for this reason. They get rain almost almost every day in the summer, and make no mistake about it, it's still summer down here. He's one and one to Vizcaino. I mean, we're on what our third Schmutzrag, I think, already, and it's uh, late September. In on the grass a little bit is Benia at third base in case Vizcaino tries to drop one down. In the soggy grass, a good time to drop one down? Oh, great time to drop one down. Anytime you can put the ball on the ground and make the infielders handle the ball with it being wet. Now Benia's back with two strikes. 
Check swing. The count will remain at one and two. But that turfless they put on the mound, the, the light stuff you see right there on the mound and around the batter's box, they put it in there mainly just for, for, for preventative. The mound is a clay and it's a sticky type clay. And as soon as it gets a little bit of water on it, it becomes slippery. So they, they keep it on there to dry up that moisture and, and to make sure his footing is solid. Top of the third, no score. Chris Berman along with Ray Knight. Runs at a premium in the National League today, that's for sure. Two to one Braves. Final over the Strohs. Nothing doing here. He just kind of needs the windshield wipers on those glasses a little bit, doesn't he? Brown thought he might have had it, sort of the crowd, but it's two and two. I wouldn't be surprised for him to come inside hard here. He's gone two pitches away with a fastball. No, he's going away again. Just kind of saw it. Th think about the move that Brian Sabian made in the offseason. I mean, they had giant fans saying, that's it. I'm not following the team anymore. You trade one of the most popular players and one of the best people in the game ever, Matt Williams. But he said, we're, we're trying to get professional at a lot of places. So we get a shortstop in Vizcaino. We get a second baseman in Jeff Kent. We get a, a guy that made a, a set of Giants record for appearances, as it turned out, in Julian Tavares. Brown just goes high and cheese to Vizcaino, strikes him out. But... And that was a gutsy move by Sabian, but it started to change the whole feeling on this ball club. Well, there's no question about it. You mentioned professional player, and that's one thing that a manager would like to have is guys that come in the front door, put on their uniform, go out and get to work, and then go out the back door after the game's over. You don't have to worry much about it. And that's certainly what they got in Mark Lewis, is what they've got in uh, J.T. Snow, and, and certainly Ken and Vizcayano. Dusty Baker looking on as Brian Johnson who has been a hero these last couple of weeks. Looks at strike one. So both catchers, you can call them Ray, you can call them Jay, and you can call them Johnson. Brian and Charles. Johnson with that huge home run Wednesday at Coors Field in the ninth inning to win the game at Colorado 4 3. Joey Hamilton wins that night for San Diego against the Dodgers, and that pretty much gave them breathing room. Not to mention, of course, his home run in the 12th inning. And that Second game of the two game set against the Dodgers. But right here, he's having trouble like everyone else against Kevin Brown as Devon White is there. And there's two outs. So eight up, eight down for Kevin Brown thus far. Well, Kevin, he's just relentless. He comes at you, he starts that ball out away from you, then a slider. Now, watch this ball. He runs this ball in on him. And Johnson again, see that backhand? How he has to bring the backhand almost straight into his belt buckle to try to get the barrel to the ball. That's just tremendous sideways movement, and there's not a whole lot you can do about it. Ball one to uh, Kirk Reeder. See Reeder, 138 hitter this year, which is better than his lifetime average going into the year at 093, and a pitch in there for a strike. Pretty good wood on the ball, and fouls it off. Well, when guys like Brown that have a nice sinker, Kip DeColvey had it, Steve Rogers had it, the way that I tried to approach them was move off the plate, make everything away, and dared him to throw the slider out away from him because you're not going to do anything with the sinker inside. That's what he's doing. He's throwing that sinker in, and they can't handle it. A hot shot to the stands right behind the dugout. Kevin Brown in his two years here with the Marlins and five starts, 4-0, ERA of 0.61, three earned runs allowed in 44 innings, and if he gets Reader, make that 47 innings. Misses outside, two and two. The Reader's had about the best at bat for the Giants thus far, right? Yeah, he's gonna dust him off here, though. <laughs> 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 Slow roller. Bonilla elects it to go to Renneria. Renneria. Renneria runs well, but Renneria throws over to Conine just in time. Nine up, nine down against Kevin Brown. No. Now Ray has left the broadcast booth and has gone down <laughs> near the field for a little while to get a better view, but. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen only one hit, a uh, line shot by Benia. No score in the bottom of the third inning, and baseball continues with our friends at Fox tonight as the Yankees begin their defense of their world championship with David Cohn. And it should be a 
intriguing scene at the Bronx, as it always is. David Cohn against Bulldog, Oral Hershiser, for the Indians and the Yankees at 8 o'clock on Fox. Then join Carl Ravitch, Peter Gammons, and all the gang for baseball tonight at midnight. Tonight, we showed you Dave Dombrowski before. Here's the general manager of the Giants, Brian Sabian. Is he making a late trade? I think it's a little late. <laughs> I think he's calling down to have you removed from what we just saw you to get back up here. <laughs> Congenial Brian Sabian, same with Dave Dombrowski, two good guys who should be very much decorated for the success of their respective teams this year. The Marlins 92 and 70, and the Giants 90 and 72. The top of the order, Devon White, Edgar Renneria, Gary Sheffield. White pop up that Kent made a nice over the shoulder grab on the outfield grass in the first inning. Reader behind him, too. And oh boy, Devo had some great postseasons we showed you earlier for the Toronto Blue Jays, especially in the ALCS. Actually, appeared in four of them one with the Angels in 86, a couple of bats against the Red Sox, the 91, 92, and 93 in Toronto. He hit 392 in those four ALCSs. Well, Chris, it's my philosophy if you're leading off the inning 2 0 in a ball game like this with no score, you take a pitch and get a strike. And here's a ball that he chases inside, way off the plate, would almost hit him in the hip, be 3 0. You know, and that's what I'm talking about being patient with a guy that you know will walk a lot of people. Reader misses, a little low and outside, it's 3 and 1. Same situation here. I'm key holding him right now. I'm looking for a ball in one particular spot. Out away from him. If he doesn't throw it there, I'm taking it and making him go to 3 2. Combination of rain and sweat and humidity. Temperature up near 90 today. Hit pretty well by Devon White to left center field. Then it's going to fall. Oh, Barry Bonds with a sliding catch. That fooled me. I thought it was hit better than it was, which fooled the outfielders. And now you see the form that's won a handful of gold gloves. Yeah, he, he's simply the best left fielder to play the game. Uh, what happens here, this is a changeup. He does not challenge him. He throws him a changeup. You see him hit it off the end of his bat. Big swing. Everybody breaks back, but Bond's having enough speed to catch the ball. <laughs> yeah, why not? He was really interesting today in those interviews saying that, that he was just here to play baseball. He mentioned God a lot and how he changed his priorities, but, you know, it was a little different interview, wasn't it? Yeah, he, Barry was, we asked him if, if he was, uh, felt pressure to redeem himself in the postseason. He hits below 200 lifetime in the postseason as showing bunt, but pulling it back is Ed Garanteria. Count as one and one. But he, he said, no, I, I'm just trying to loosen up. I was too tight. I loosened up these last couple of weeks that his dad really picked up some flaws in his batting stroke. And that helped him to a great last couple of weeks. Javier will run to the line make the play on Renneria and there are two downs but I, I Barry knows all eyes are on him um, not that you have to apologize for a season in which you had 40 homers 101 RBIs you steal 37 bases meaning that he and his dad by far and away with five 30 30 seasons at, at, at more than anybody in the history of baseball but I think for the first time in Barry's career, as Sheffield comes up, he, he couldn't just press the button every time, Ray. Did you see it earlier this year in, in managing against him? Well, he scared me to death. I walked him every time I could, and then when I didn't walk him, he hit a bomb to beat us. So, you know, I, I didn't see any difference in him. I, I, um, I'm i scared to death of him. I was scared to death of him. Just as I was Sheffield as a manager, you just can't let those guys beat you. And Sheffield gets under this one. It may draw some more rain by the time it comes down in the glove of Daryl Hamilton. So one, two, three inning for Kirk Reeder with a little bit of help from his friend. Barry Bonds in left field. Well, Debo didn't like it, but he almost got a, a two-bagger. Were it not for the diving Bonds. Top of the fourth scoreless between the Giants and Marlins in this first game of this best of five series in the National League is Kevin Brown has been perfect. He now will try the top of the order again. Daryl Hamilton swing at the first pitch. Renteria backhands nicely. Conine one out. Right, Renteria was smooth on that. Play, oh right? man, he can play. I don't think anybody goes in the hole better. You saw how he goes up the middle, but that goes back to those quick feet and that first step. 
Watch him put his head down on this play. Ball's hit hard to his right. Look at his head go right down to the ball and watch it right into his glove. Position his feet, little crow hop, and he's got something to throw with. So two ground ball outs for Hamilton. Now Billy Miller, who granted to Renteria his first time up. Let's see, two strikeouts for Brown. Eight ground, uh, six ground ball outs. Just two flies to the outfield thus far. So only two balls have left the infield as the Giants send their 11th batter to the plate. Again, we reiterate that on June the 10th in San Francisco, Brown authored the second no-hitter in Marlins history. That's part of the reason why now three and a third no hits, but there's another ground ball. This time it's the Craig Council, so he gets involved, and there's two out. But we should say now 21 and two thirds innings. Just one run, and that was a home run to Marvin Bernard in an 8 1 win here in September. And just three hits. So he continues to have their number, and he's had Barry Bonds' number. Bonds is now one for 15 against Kevin Brown a lifetime. He flew out to right field in the first inning and looks at strike one. We brought up the name Kevin Brown. He started laughing during that interview, didn't he? Yes, he did. Oh, you know, Kevin Brown. He, he didn't really know what to say, except. Well, he said something to me that was impressive, and, and we got it on tape, uh, about Kevin Brown will come right at you, whereas a guy like Maddox Kent. Came at him there, jammed him. This will float out of play. Got two rows deep. And the count remains at 0-2. The Marlins are playing Bonds way around. Actually, Bonilla is at shortstop. You've got three men on the right side, just like the Ted Williams shift. They're hoping that he tries to go the other way. Look at the hole right there at third base. You could drive about three semi trucks through that. Well, he certainly is not going to pitch it outside with a hole there as he comes high and tight and misses one and two. Well, he, he believes that he's going to pull the ball even if he throws the ball mm -hmm. away. That one was high and outside, two and two. But Barry knows as much about hitting. He talked about his father, but he knows as much about hitting as anybody I've ever talked to. He really knows his stance, how to set his bat up. Crowd wanted it, but it was outside. Well, he has, along with Joe Morgan, the best two eyes I've seen in the game. But the ball just moves off the strike zone with that nasty sinking action. This time he gets Bonds. He's won for 16 against the lifetime. 12 up. 12 down against Kevin Brown. He has been renowned. No score. Bottom of the fourth inning. The only hit belongs to the Marlins, and it belongs to the man at the plate, Bobby Bonilla, as he leads off against Kirk Reeder, who has almost matched the brilliance of Kevin Brown in a totally different way. Bonilla swings at the first pitch to right field. Stan Javier near the track, on the track, makes the catch. Bobby Bow is gone, one out. Let's well, talk about what Reader's doing here, Ray. He's, he's, he's getting him in different ways. Well, he is, and there's a lot of ways to pitch and pitch successfully. He's moving the ball around, not throwing a lot of fat pitches as far as fastballs. That pitch was up and out of the strike zone. He's throwing the slider and the changeup. But, you know, going back to uh, a little bit about Kevin Brown, last year he was next to last in the league in run support, barely got three runs uh, per game for him. This Inside year, strike to Moises Lou. Right. I'm sorry, Ray. This year, he's in a, like seventh, the top ten in least run support. So you wonder why he doesn't win 20 games. Hit pretty well to left field, back, but not far enough. Right to the track again is Barry Bonds. Now, Reader, almost all his outs are being recorded as fly balls to the outfield. Well, he's a high ball pitcher, a, a changeup type pitcher, and you have a tendency to hit those balls in the air if you stay inside the ball. Here again, the ball is going to be up, waist high, and you're going to hit those balls in the air. Whereas the pitch that Brown throws is always down around your kneecaps or your shins, and, and it's moving so hard away from you, it's hard to get the ball in the air. Off-speed pitch to Jeff Conine is in there. No, misses for a ball. 
it is much easier, much easier. It's a better park here at Pro Player Stadium for right-handed hitters. The line in left field is 330. The line in right is 345. Straightaway left is 361. Straightaway right is 385. And that's part of the reason why the Marlins have the best home record in baseball with the success of their right-handed hitters. Yep, of course, he's a switch hitter, but Moise is a Lou, having 115 RBIs. They, they don't have that many home runs, but it's easier to get the ball out of here if you're a righty. Sheffield, of course. This is a fly ball to straightaway left field. So three fly ball outs. Brown does it on the ground. Reader does it in the air. One if by land, two if by sea. Three if you get a run. We've had none. Yeah, this just in. Charles Johnson is great. 171 games without an error. But he helps his pitchers so much. He gets borderline pitches. Watch this pitch. Low and away, but he gets the strike. Why? Look at the left elbow, the glove elbow outside the strike zone. Brings it back in. Also catches the ball with the glove up, not turned down. You buy those few pitches. That might be the difference between a no-hitter, a perfect game. The way Kevin Brown's going today, he's getting some help from Charles Johnson. Well, every pitcher gets the help from Charles Johnson, Dave. That's right. He, he really is baseball's best kept secret. Don't you think, Ray, with the he was surprised when he was tabbed to the all star team. They thought they was kidding. I, I made a statement earlier in the year that he could be the MVP of the league uh, uh, about August when he started hitting all those home runs, ended up with 19. Uh, but nobody stops the run like him. We had an outstanding speed team in Cincinnati and and uh, I just stopped putting a steel sign on because everybody every time we ran we were out. J.T. Snow looks at two balls so the count two and oh to him. Snow is one of the few that's had some success for the Giants against Kevin Brown. Lots of success. Seven for 19 coming in and he does go the opposite way and look at Benia. It's a Conine to strike. Right, Bobby Bow questions to him at third but not on that ball. Oh, that's a great play. That's a very difficult play for a third baseman to backhand the ball. Remember the slick grass. Remember how the ball scoots off the grass. And, and this second hop here is going to just jump on him. He made a great play there. That is a tremendous concentration play. And nobody knows how tough that is unless you've done it. Watch this ball scoot on that back top. And it picks up speed like you saw early with Bonds in the outfield. That ball actually, if it's possible, picks up speed or at least it doesn't slow down uh, off of that slick grass. That'll bring up Jeff Kent who if you were going to vote for MVP of the Giants you'd really have to look at him what he's done this year breaking the franchise record for homers and ribbies by second baseman I'm saying the franchise not only San Francisco record of Robbie Thompson the franchise record, which was set by some guy named Rogers Hornsby, who I think was a wow. pretty good hitter. Wow. <laughs> the last time I checked, Rogers Hornsby was, you know, he could hit a little. The single season record in baseball for best batting average, 424. 1-1 one, one pitch to Kent. Hits this one to right field, inside out, said but Sheffield is there. A rare fly ball out, but an out nevertheless. And the Giants have sent 14 up and 14 down. Against Kevin Brown. Well, as Dusty looks on, and you know, he says, "Hey, if you're going to give me 11 of 14 batters, in which it's a first pitch strike, and you're going to pitch like this, yeah. Dusty's well, that, looking for anything." Well, that's the key. That's the key for a pitcher to get ahead. So many pit pitchers are bat shy. Uh, you know, they're just scared of contact, and and they end up throwing three, four, five pitchers per batter. They end up only being able to go six innings. This man comes right at you and gets ahead of you with strikes. Stan Javier looks at strike one. Javier grounded and broke his bat, chopped it back to the pitcher to end the second inning. Stan, of course, the son of Julian and Javier, fine second baseman with those pennant winning World Series clubs of the Cardinals in the 60s. So there's that tight slider. He is really a cutter, 93 miles an hour cutter. You don't think that's nasty. Throwing his fastball about 95, running away from the left-hander, then cuts that ball inside. Ground ball up the middle. Renteria dives and can't get it. And the Giants have their first base runner. And not that he was concerned about it, but wherever he's watching the game, and I'm sure he is, 
Don Larson said, okay, I'm still the only one in the postseason, huh? Wow, 15, 14 retired until that base hit by Javier. This ball comes up when Renario or hit a hat. It. See the ball comes up on that last little hop? He was there, he had his glove there, he had the palm outstretched, but just a little jump on the part of the, uh, off the ground there and, and caused him to miss that ball. Now, there's two outs, so I think I know the answer here. Maybe I don't, and we do have Charles Johnson behind the plate who, in addition to everything else he does, throughout about 43% of the runners this year. Javier, not a great runner, but can move. Brown is a righty. You've got your first base runner. Do you take a chance Vizcano can handle the battle a little bit? Oh, with two outs, what you're going to do here is if he does steal, then he's going to probably pitch around Vizcano and, and, uh, and well, actually, no. Johnson's up next. I don't think he's going to run. Would you? I, I wouldn't. And, and the only reason, only reason I wouldn't is because I think he's going to get thrown out. You, you can bet uh, John, uh, Brown knows um, that Javier can run, and he's going to slide step or get rid of the ball quickly. Uh, but again, if you're not hitting, you've got to try to create some offense. And, and, uh, but this guy hasn't made an error. What that tells you is he's not thrown one ball away all year long to second base, and that's generally where catchers get their errors, throwing the ball away to center field. So that Javier has stolen 25 bases second. There he goes. Johnson fires. Oh, man. His strike was as good as Kevin Brown's strikes. Oh, man. They gamble, and Charles Johnson makes him pay. Brown and Johnson. Bottom of the fifth inning. Crowd pick it up a little bit, and a round of applause for Charles Johnson, who gunned down Stan Javier, and we are scoreless. 789 Johnson Council and Brown to face Kirk Reeder who has retired his last seven batters six straight fly ball out. Here's a long fly ball but it will find the seats in foul territory and here's the gun Ray. Well Kevin unloads the ball it's an easy ball to handle fastball just moving away Johnson's quick feet you talk about guys arms but his feet just as Dave said about the shortstop. His quick feet allows him to get himself in position and use that cannon to throw people out. Now, we talked about, there it is, 45% this year. Who was first? <laughs> yeah. Brad Asmus for the Strohs from Cheshire, Connecticut. And Johnson frozen at the plate, and Reeder gets a strikeout. His third of the afternoon. Well, Reeder sets up to throw the ball away and just throws it right there. That ball's a little... To me, a little away. You start expanding the plate like that, and and it becomes really tough to hit. Ball looked a tad outside to me. So I'll bring up Craig Council, who drew a base on balls in the second inning. There's a little stride toward the plate. That's one thing about umpires, Chris, that when pitchers start throwing the ball around the plate, they do start spreading the strikes on a little bit, and and certainly these guys have. And there's Mark Kerspeck. <laughs> Count is one and one to Council. Oh, loaded with Connecticut guys. Mark from Connecticut. You mentioned Brad Aspen. Terry Tate, who the umps are from central part of the state of Connecticut. We always keep track of our nutmeg guys. Reader is ahead one and two. Kirk Reeder from Hoylton, Illinois, a hometown of about 300. <laughs> and it's near St. Louis, so he grew up watching the Cardinals, even though it's in Illinois. And when the Giants played in St. Louis, he took about half a dozen of his teammates to see his hometown. And you know, it was one of those one light, one general store. They've been ribbing him about it since, but they're proud of him there. Here's a ground ball diving off the glove of Kent. Base hit for Council. He rounds. But up with it quickly is Hamilton and Council alertly if Hamilton was slow is thinking second base. Well there's no way Hamilton is going to be slow on that. He knows that Council runs hard all the time right out of the box. We mentioned those little things. That's a Pete Rose type play there. How McRae type play. You hit balls through the infield. Seen Larry Walker do it 15 times. But what can't watch Council break out of the box. When he hits this ball he is going full speed. I'm talking full speed. Ball gets through the infield. He makes a big turn going to second base and just the alertness of the outfielder keeps him at first. So Council's been aboard twice. Kevin Brown tries to bunt it, but fouls it back. Just to finish on, on Illinois, but they have a big sign there. You know, home, 
Welcome to Hoylton, Illinois, home of Major League pitcher Kirk Reeder. They're very proud of him as well they should be. And you know, Reeder was almost in the record books when he came up with Montreal. His first 10 decisions were all wins. I remember the that. Expos. I was coaching with the Reds at that time. He he had a very exceptional start. I think that was spread over two years, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yes, it was. He's up and down from the Lynx, Ottawa Lynx. And he'll keep his eye on the base runner count. So the record is 12, by the way, set by Butch Metzger. Came up quickly with the Giants, but really with the Padres. And a guy named Hooks Wiltsey. Who? Hooks Wiltsey. Huh. 19 aught five. New York Giants have won John McGraw, won their first 12 decisions at Reader 110. So he was close. Brown can't lay this one down either. So that, he really hurt himself here because now he's got a chop at it. Well, this is a thing that really just wears managers out. I had a tough time accepting things uh, fundamentally in Cincinnati, and and it drove me crazy. And, and in result, I drove him crazy. But you know, he's got his bat barrel up, but then he dips at the ball. You just have to catch the ball with your top hand. Just think about catching it with your top hand, and it's not very difficult to bunt. Well, I mean, it's difficult to bunt maybe a sinker by Brown, but those, those pitches aren't as difficult, are they, Ray? Well, the ball's up. Is 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 a ball that you tend to foul off, but I just don't think bunting is very difficult. He's going to try it again and going to strike out. When you offer the bunt at the third pitch, it's a strikeout. So I think Jimmy's a little disappointed there, although he can't be disappointed with the way he's pitched. No, but you know, and I'm not. This is not a knock on Kevin Brown, but it's just a knock on what I see in the National League. Watch his bat barrel go down at the ball. I mean, he ends up with his bat on the home plate. You cannot do that. You can't stab at the ball. You've got to almost catch the ball with your top hand on the bat barrel. With your bat angle up, and at the worst you do is you get the bat level. But it, it's really atrocious in the major leagues, uh, obviously, especially in the National League, how bunning uh, with pitchers is. Uh, the Atlanta Braves, everybody just watch that staff. That's why they win. Uh, they're great bunners. They're great handles of the bat. And uh, anytime you do that, you're going to help yourself with a winner or two a year. Devon White, 0 for 2, robbed by Barry Bonds in a little <laughs> diving. I don't want to say a flare, but a ball that was dying in left center field. And Barry Bonds slid about halfway to center to make the catch. First inning, Devo popped up to Jeff Kent on the outfield grass behind second. This is a good situation to run in here. You have 0-1. With a guy that throws the ball around the plate. And what you do with a left hander, you just go on first move. It's tough with two strikes because he has a tendency to throw over there or waste a pitch. But you've got two outs. Council runs decently at first base. And and just as we talked about before, I just try to read the pitcher here and, and get a good feel for him. He's seen enough pitches over there and break on first move and, and hope that you read him right. Good pitch job. out, nothing going. Sel seldom do you see Chris anybody coming back with back-to-back uh, -back pitch outs. Uh, so one and two is a good pitch to run on here. Throw him something that's a bad pitch, a moving pitch, a breaking ball. Ooh, Reader and Johnson wanted that one. They did not get it. Two and two. Well, he sets up outside and throws this ball right there. Mm. I think he probably called that ball down because it certainly looked like it got the corner of the plate. Keeps an eye on council. You know, we talked about Kevin Brown's mastery of the uh, of the Giants, but this is Reader's second outing here this year, and in his first outing it was five innings pitch, six hits, no runs. So they've yet to score a run off him in this park. Well, we wanted that one too, and Hirschbeck did not give it to him, and now the count is full. No, it seems like uh, Mark is calling the ball more on the outside part of the plate to right-handers, left-handers. That ball. It's still off the plate. I think he's getting it. I think he's getting it right. Slow grounder to Kent. Debo can run pretty well, but the throw is to Snow. Council is stranded. And the goose eggs are matched. We've played five. ESPN's presentation of the 1997 Division Series is brought to you by Dunlop Tires. 
Handle it with Dunlop Tires and by National Car Rental. So what are you waiting for? Let's go. Rain has stopped for a couple innings, but the hitting has not started as Kevin Brown and Kirk Reeder are trading goose eggs. We begin the sixth inning. Vizcaino, who was at the plate when Javier was gunned down in an attempted steal by Charles Johnson. So the Giants go 7-8-9. Vizcaino, Brian Johnson, Kirk Reeder. Benilla in on the grass. The step at shot. That'll be a foul ball. Hits him in the batter's box. He said at the outset, Ray, that we thought that runs would be at a premium, not only because of Kevin Brown, that maybe every game in this series is going to be a nip and tucker. And, well, five innings, we look pretty good. Haven't done anything to disprove it, have we? No. <laughs> This Kaino had 266 this year. The regular shortstop for Dusty Baker. And misses it's at one and two. Solid glove. Coming over in that Matt Williams trade from Cleveland. Little chopper, but that'll be foul. Kevin Brown has been an all-star twice. Started uh, the All-Star game in 92 at San Diego for the American League. That was the game that they tattooed Tommy Glavin at the beginning. This he only went the one inning with all the way that it worked in that game and all the runs, and he got the win. Made the All-Star team a year ago. Of all the things that goes into hitting a baseball, the toughest thing is to hit a moving pitch that moves late. And that's why Kevin Brown's so tough. There's people that throw harder. But he's got that nice little cutter right there that he bears in on your hands. And the ball never is where your eyes last see it. You pick up the ball out in front of the plate, probably about 10 feet out in front of the plate. And as you go to hit the ball, it's never where it was. There's always that late movement. That subtle movement gets people killed. Kirk Breeder has been Brown's equal, although doing it differently. Brings up Vizcaino. Boy, when he punches that inside corner, Ray, he is very effective. He's got a couple of Giants looking at that pitch. Well, the ball just starts in, and it seems really tight to a hitter, and then it moves back. And it's no question about it being a strike. But the ball looks as if it's coming in on you. And there you see the sideways rotation on the ball. Ball just moves back onto the plate. But it just seems like it's pinching you as a hitter. And you lay off of it, and boom. Four strikeouts now for Kevin Brown. And he'll face Brian Johnson hacking at the first pitch. I didn't mean to short shrift Kevin because, I, of course, he made the All-Star team this year as well. He pitched an inning and gave up one hit and no runs. The All-Star game in Cleveland. So he's been an All-Star three times, both years with the Marlins. Brian Johnson flew out to center field. The second out of the third inning. Johnson in a trade from Detroit for Marcus Jensen. Just after the All-Star break. Middle of July. And he essentially took over the Giants starting catching job, which was Rick Wilkins, who's no longer with the club. Conine pitches to Brown. Johnson is out soup. You got something for it? Sometimes in games like this, it's going to be the little things. Ray, you talked about the bat position of Kevin Brown. He starts with it at the 45-degree angle, drops it. Look at the bat up, drops it. One more time, bat up, drops it. You, all you can do is foul it off or butt it in the air. Bad technique by Kevin Brown. That's about the only thing he's done wrong today. <laughs> You're right, Dave. Giving up just the one hit to Stan Javier. Now we'll face Kirk Reeder, who at least is chopping at that first pitch. Chops it foul for a strike. Reeder grounded out to short in the third inning. Unlike Kevin Brown, who has the six complete games, Reeder has not gone the route this year. And look at this. He does what Brown can't do. He can handle the bat. Look at like that. The, the Giants can't figure out how to hit him, and they, they send up their pitcher, Kurt Reeder, and he has a base hit, although with two outs. Well, he is swinging the bat, and there's one thing that pitchers do that don't get a chance to hit a lot. They go up there swinging the bat. Here's a pitch that's out over the plate. He hits it on the end of the bat, and there's just nothing you can do. There's no man's land out there, even though Morse Alou is, is cheating way in with two outs and the left-handed hitting pitcher up. The ball's just in there, and you can't catch it. 
So Daryl Hamilton, two infield ground outs. One to third, one to short will step in. I am tight, ball one. I mean, Dusty needs any run, obviously, but I don't think he wants Reader winded. Although he'll take his chances. Let's say it's on a double or something. He's got to send him home. Well, that's just a matter of what the third baseman reads over there. Dusty is pretty much out of the situation now. He's certainly not going to run the pitcher, but uh, the third baseman, Sonny Jackson, will read what the outfield does, and, and based upon what he knows about Reader's speed, will either hold him or send him. But you realize that you're in the uh, top part of the lineup, and you certainly don't want to run into an out. Well, Kevin's not used to working with base runners on. Heaven forbid he's not pitching with five seconds in between each pitch. And misses that one three and all. Well, you know, I, I didn't say this earlier, but I had read reports this year that if you get runners on base, he has a tough time getting the ball over the plate. He's much more comfortable when he's not in the stretch. And and uh, we just didn't get very many people on <laughs> on base. And and uh, this is only his second three ball count. So he's not real comfortable with runners on base. Take all the way. Absolutely. He took it was a strike three and one. Grounded. That'll be foul, not handled by Carlos Alfonso, the first base coach, although he did give it an effort. Now he's battled back from a 3 0 count to make it 3 and 2, and a word for Reader with Alfonso. Just tell him to make sure he pitches here. You're going on the uh, delivery to the ball home on a 3 2 pitch with two outs. Here goes Reader, and it's hit. Oh, it's caught by Conine. That had danger and a potential run written all over it, but Conine makes the play, and the fans are on their feet. We're headed to the bottom of the sixth, scoreless in Florida. Giants had a chance, but Jeff Conine made the defensive play on Daryl Hamilton, so we're scoreless, Ray, here in the bottom of the sixth inning. Well, Jeff Conine, a world-class racquetball player, a handball player, uh, watch how quick he reacts to this. This is a run. You see Reader there running, and this ball is, is smoked down the line. He just makes a great reactive play. Comes up, makes a little high throw, but Brown, with his great athleticism, makes the play. And like all managers, they, Dusty Baker knows that they're not going to get a lot of chances off this man, and that's one chance that got by them. Reader took his time getting back to the mound, and this Conine who made the play, and you know, although Jeff really played most of his career as an outfielder, he is the better glove man compared to Darren Dalton, of course, and the, the, the Dutch has hardly played first base till this year. And you just saw that, well, the well, straight platoon worked in Jimmy Leland's favor oh, there. It did. Uh, Dutch probably doesn't get that ball. He has those knees that he has a problem with, and, and uh, you know, he hasn't played a lot of first base. Conine hasn't played a lot, but he's got that great, uh, that great ability to react. And Jimmy Leland knows that. Uh, Codine's also an outstanding left fielder. He just can't find a place to play every day on this ball club because they're so deep. Jimmy Leland a little bit under the weather, but uh, it's playoff time, and I don't think that that was going to hold him away from the park. It's Kirk Reeder, his last start we talked about in the middle of September, he added to this one. He's pitched 10 innings here this year. He's allowed no runs and given up just eight hits, so he's done his job certainly against these Marlins as well as Almost as well as Kevin Brown has done against the Giants. Well, he really has. He hasn't left any ball spat out over the plate. The ball is either on the outside part of the plate. You've noticed that every time that Johnson has set up, he's put the ball right there. Edgar in the reaches out with a solid base hit to center field on an 0-1 pitch. And the number two man is on, and the table setter is ready for Gary Sheffield and Bobby Bonilla. So, you know, Reader was on the base pass, although the ball was, was played quickly. It's not like he ran two or three bases. He took an awful long time being toweled off on this 
humid weather, Ray, and we'll have to watch it. Maybe it affected him a little bit. Well, it does affect him. What I learned most in managing, I truly believe, is that pitchers have a rhythm, and you can't come out of the dugout and talk to them. You can't just disrupt that rhythm. They believe in and uh, and getting in a rhythm and staying in the rhythm, and they don't like to be disrupted, and base running is a disruption. Three hits now for the Marlins as Gary Sheffield walk and a fly out the center steps up. Much was expected when they signed him to what $16 million six year deal. And he didn't really deliver as far as numbers. Though he was very frustrated the way he was being pitched around. Earlier this year took him a while to get set on the way pitchers were dealing with him more than usual. As we said had a big month of September and hopes to continue it here. Well of course we're still in September. Well, I don't really understand why they pitched around him more this year than they did in the past because he certainly was surrounded by better hitters. Off speed pitch that misses on the outside. And Reader behind the Sheffield 2 0. One thing that surprised me this year, too, is Renneria ran 47 times in front of Sheffield. Uh, stole 32 bases, but actually attempted 47 steals. Making sure that Tommy Sand, the first base coach, says, mm, I don't know if we send him now. No, he's saying, I don't want to send him. Right. Foul hit the bat twice. Would hit you? it on the front and the back. Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Leland knows that he's got the firepower of his lineup here, and there's no sense in running into an out. Reader's got a good move. He gets the, rid of the ball quickly. Uh, Brad Johnson throws fairly well. So there's no reason to run two and one. You don't want to run three and one. He may send it. Reader keeps his eye on Renneria. Sheffield has had some success against Reader. He's five for 14, including the 0 for 1 today, including a home run. Dusty Baker knows that. Conine has also had some success against Reader through the years. Oh, he pulled the string on that one. Count is now two and two. Well, that's what he does so well. 73 miles an hour breaking ball after throwing the ball about 85, but that's about a foot and a half, 18 inches to two feet, and uh, that's what offsets their timing, and as a result, they have a tough time getting the bat on the ball. Inside fastball, the count is full. As a hitter, generally after something really soft comes something really hard. The best pitch, you want to throw your hardest pitch inside. And then he's probably going to come back. Looks like he wants to go in again. Going to bust him inside again. No, that was a sign to go over the first base. Now, we saw Leland make the sign to Tommy Sant, the first base coach. But at three and two, I, I know there's none out. And you get Benia next. Now, do you change? No, I send him here just because I want, to, want the infielders moving. There you go. Off-speed pitch. Ball four. And the Marlins have something going here in the bottom of the sixth. Two on with none out for Bobby Benia. Yeah, it's starting to drizzle again. You see some of the fans... Uh, who aren't bothered by it right now, Ray, and maybe it might bother Reader a little bit. Well, I don't know that it's going to bother Reader. What's bothering Reader right now is Bonilla at the plate. This is a real interesting situation. You're going to see Brian Johnson go out and talk to the infielders about what to do. We talked about the wheel play, the straight-up play, where the third baseman stays back and the pitcher charges the mound. Uh, there you see Johnson going out and giving the sign. This is a real tough call right here for Jimmy Leland. You've got to figure two runs will win this ball game. Do you bunt Bobby Benini here, or do you let him swing? With a Lou and Conine behind him, i got to believe he might bunt him. I don't know if Bobby Benini can bunt, but we'll see right here. Well, he's had lots of success against Reader, as you can see. He's one for two today with that solid single to left field in the first inning, but Reader well, gets him to foul at all. Well, Jimmy knows this man better than anybody, and, and he is a, a tremendous clutch hitter. And he's a four-hole hitter. Not too many people like to button that four-hole hitter. So he figures what he'll do is he'll take three shots with Benilla, Alou, and Conine to drive in that run at second. Just missed outside. One and one. 
Julian Tavares. Rubber arm Julian Tavares who after a rough first six weeks really came on and broke Mike Jackson's San Francisco record. Club record for appearances this year. Up the middle coming on is Hamilton makes a sliding grab and alertly Renneria started the third and came back to second. So two nice sliding grabs in the outfield. One by Bonds earlier. One by Hamilton there and a big play and a big out. Well, the only way you make that play if you move on the crack of the bat and you watch Hamilton here, he just reacts immediately to the ball, dives, catches the ball. J just a great play, a reactive play, and that's just instincts. Moises Alou up. One Daryl Hamilton went 166 straight games without an error, 389 chances without an error. Last year, breaking the old mark, the major hit by Stan Javier, who is now his teammate. So that's the type of defensive player he is, but still two on and only one out. Moises Alou up. Pretty good speed on the bases. I know we we do use it a lot. You get a guy that forgets about you at second base, and the tendency is for a pitcher to forget about you out there when he's in a jam. You steal second and third. Off speed, fly to right field. Javier makes the catch. Renneria bluffs the tag to throw one hops or several hops by the time it gets to Vizcaino. So two big outs recorded with two men on here. Now there's two outs. And Jeff Conine is up. We showed you Benia against Reader. Jeff Conine, one of the original Marlins, is 0 for 2 today, but 6 for 17 lifetime against Reader. Conine taken in the expansion draft by these Marlins from the Kansas City Royals. You mentioned he's a world-class racquetball player, and so is his wife Cindy. They, they entered doubles competition, mixed doubles competition, but wouldn't mind playing a little racquetball with that uh, teal tower, that wall in left field right now. <laughs> Conine fly to right, fly to left this afternoon. Inside ball one. Generally, in a situation like this, Je Jeff Conine tries to take the ball right back up the middle. Keeps that left shoulder inside, keeps his head on the ball, stays inside the ball. He hits a lot of balls up the middle with two outs, running on second base. Off speed, tries it outside, misses 2 0. Oh. Coming in hard. Is that what Conine's looking for, Ray? I don't. I, if he, I don't. He doesn't like the ball in. He likes the ball out away from him. I think he's still going to look for a ball out away from him and try not to pull him. Fly ball to right field. Javier toward the line, and he makes the play. So Kirk Reeder does it, doing what he does best. After two got on, he got three fly ball outs. We played six. Who's going to score? Seventh inning stretch time in Florida. If you are one of the few Giants fans, and just as the Marlins got something going with the number two and three hitters getting on base, the number two and three hitters, Bill Miller and Barry Bonds, coming up here for the Giants in the seventh. Boy, one swing of the bat. That could be the only run you need at this point, Ray, the way these guys are going. It certainly, it certainly looks that way, and, and uh, Barry, he always has a way. I don't, I don't care how people pitch him. He has a way of eventually figuring a way to beat you. Bill Miller sends it to right field. Back goes Sheffield. Back, back, back. Gone! We're talking Bonds going deep. It's Bill Miller, who only had seven home runs this year. The Giants getting contribution from where they didn't know they had players to do these things. And Miller has busted open the scoreless battle. It's 1-0 San Francisco. Fastball right over the plate. Starting inside, moving back over the plate. Miller just turned those hips and extended, and the ball flew out of here. He's a scrappy player who opened Dusty Baker's eyes last year in a horrible second half for the team. As fastball inside the Barry Bonds, it's one and one. And he's really been swinging a good bat here in, in September and 
does. He just likes the way he plays. Again, that bond shift is on with three infielders to the right at second base. Well, sometimes pitchers concentration or lack of will hammer you. Kevin Brown's concentrated the whole ball game. Then all of a sudden he's facing a situation late in the game where he's right in the middle of the lineup. He certainly fears Bonds and Snow more than he does Miller. Makes a pitch fat over the plate, a home run. Bonds gets under this a little too much, although it's a long run from Wicks. It's a low. Maybe it's not too much. It's off the teal tower. Bonds thinks about a triple and goes back for a double. That ball kept carried. Ray, I think the ball's carrying better than it was at the beginning of the game. At least that one looked like it did. It may be. I, all I know is when he hits the ball in the air, it has a ten, tendency to carry. <laughs> oh, man, he gets that spin. Let's watch his swing. Just watch how quick his hands just fly through the zone there. He had that ball in a good part of the bat. Just hit it a little high. Certainly hit it far enough. Just, just hit it a little high. Took off a little distance. Man. Well, we talked about the number two and three hitters for Florida getting aboard. The Giants have won up them with a homer by Miller and a double by Bonds. So one run in, still nobody out, and J.T. Snow is up. Was struck out and grounded to third. Chops it wide at first base. In well, this situation, Chris, manager will tell you to um, get him over or bunt him over or do whatever you can to get the run over. That's why Barry Bonds at second base was looking to find out what Sonny Jackson wanted him to do. Did he want him to hold, which means you can't steal, or does he want J.T. Snow to pull the ball to the right side, or is he just going to bunt him over? So that's why he was asking. Now that one back, count is 0-2. You saw that look at uh, Dennis Cook. Dennis Short Order Cook is the lefty in the bullpen, and Jay Powell has been a great setup man for Rob Nen is the righty. Kevin is Kevin is upset with himself, that's for sure. You saw a look at Billy Miller before, the old man from Southwest Missouri State. Grew up in St. Louis. Baseball, Tom big baseball fan, and a lot of fans in San Francisco right now with that home run fastball inside. So we're getting a couple more fastballs now, maybe out of a little frustration. Maybe so. I I um, I think that Kevin has a tendency to be real hard on himself. That's what they say in the book about him. Uh, that he tends to press situations and you know, he's pitching great. He made one mistake. Bonds is going to get his hits eventually. I don't care who you are. So it's just a one-run ball game. So, you know, I know that Kevin feels, though, that, that he has a tough time getting run support. He's had so many games like this over the last two years that, you know, he's always pitching behind one to nothing, tied one to one. Snow skies it behind short Renteria back, but a little in. Moises makes the play. Bonds back to second, one out. Well, that's one of those little things, Chris. Failure to get the runner over to third base with nobody out. And that's something that can come back and haunt you. Jeff can't hit a fly ball here. Uh, it changes the defense. If, if Bonds is on third, the infield has to be in. Snow's going in there and throwing that. And he knows. He, 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 oh, he knows. You could tell by the first two swings that he was trying to pull the ball. There's no question about it. But then with two strikes, you're just trying to put the ball in play. Well, his game plan going in was to go the other way. Remember, he was uh, right, right, robbed by Bonilla. But you're right in that situation. So he wasn't going in, but he's had trouble pulling the ball against Brown and could not do it there. And as a result, the runners at second base with Jeff Kent up, who was 0 for 2. Told you what a huge season Jeff has had. 29 homers, 121 RBIs. Coming over in that Matt Williams trade bonds dance. Trying to disrupt Brown. And boy, well, he does a fastball that made Kent dance a little bit. One and one. This ball just gets away from Kevin here. He's dropping down a little bit. He, he's not getting on top of the ball right now the way he normally does. And he's dropping down a little bit, getting his hand down under the baseball. And as a result, that's going to cause the ball to run more. Let's make no mistake about it. Bonds is run at second base. Potential run is huge. It's huge. You see Council holding close there because he respects the speed. Inside again, fastball. Two and one. Sometimes as managers, Chris, we ask too much of our players. 
you ask a guy to do something that he's not really capable of doing. JT Snow, you mentioned coming into the game, wanting to hit the ball the other way. He's asked to pull the ball. That's a little against his game plan, but you have to do it if you're a team player. Bring the ball in there for a strike. It's two and two to Kent. The Bonds at second base, one run home, courtesy of Bill Miller. Inside, the count is full to Kent. Jeff Kent is a middle hitter. He likes the ball middle of the plate. He pulls the ball hard. Most of his home runs are to left field. But a lot of people think he's a pull hitter and he likes the ball inside. He, he doesn't like the ball in. He likes the ball out over the plate, and he pulls that ball out over the plate. Rip. Renneria has it. Bonds is back to second base to avoid the double play. Now, Renneria has impressed the shortstop, and now there's two outs. Here he throws a slider here and just a little bitty cutter and, and the ball just gets down on the end of the bat. There you see Bonds with those great instincts. Knowing right where the shortstop is. All you runners out there, all you young players out there, you can hit, you can feel, but you've got to play the game knowing everything about the game. Pay attention. Barry Bonds, along with Ken Griffey, Barry Larkin, I think play the game better than anybody in, in baseball because they always know where the outfield is, where the infield is, what the situation calls for, and you just see them never make a mistake. Stan Javier has uh, one of the four hits for the Giants off of Kevin Brown, a single in the fifth inning, looks at strike one. Busted down and in. It'll be a ball, one and one. Javier's 12th season in the major. There's Kevin's numbers, and uh, pretty, pretty impressive. Uh, unfortunately for him and the Marlins, at this point, he surrendered the only run of the game. Doors a little bit. Count as one of two. Now he seems to be settled back in that rhythm a little bit more, Ray. Don't you see it? Yeah, I uh, I just see a great pitcher that doesn't give up a lot, battles himself because he's such a perfectionist, went to Georgia Tech, very bright. Fastball up, two and two. Marlon's been now a little bit quiet. He's having to settle down. Uh, but he's a third hitter next yes. inning, so they're, they're they're both warm. Yeah, whoever Jimmy Leland's going to call on. Gets Javier and a buster down and in. Bonds is stranded at second, but the Giants have broken through this chess match. Billy Miller home run to right center field, and San Francisco leads. The Giants have broken this deadlock. They lead it one nothing here at seventh inning stretch time at Pro Player Stadium. Charles Johnson, Craig Council, and a pinch hitter for the pitcher Kevin Brown here in the seventh inning for Florida in their first ever postseason game, and then that's just their fifth season in the majors. Johnson tapped back to the mound and struck out looking. You know, if we get a situation with first and second, he may not pinch it here for uh, for Kevin if he thinks he can bunt. 0-2 pitch by Reeder. High and sailed over the head of Brian Johnson. One and two. And the on-deck batter council has been aboard both times. A walk and a sink. Outside again, two and two. John Cangelosi has a bat in the dugout, so maybe he will hit. That's the plan right now, perhaps, to hit for Kevin Brown, depending on situation. Well, you mentioned Council being on base. Um, 
it's really a, a situation that is kind of that reverse platoon where left handers hit 281 against Reader and right handers hit 261. So a 20 point difference with left handers hitting. Off speed drill by oh, yeah. Johnson to left field. Back it goes back, 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 back. We're tied up at one. seventh inning. Johnson had 19 of them during the season. None bigger than this. Hanging breaking ball right there. Starts away from him where his shoulder goes to the ball. Just stays right out of the plate. Real lazy and that's built in elevation. Boy that ball was smoked. Craig Council up with Miller a step in on the grass. Well wow, Johnson hadn't gotten the ball out of the infield and that ball was halfway up in the first covered row of seats, or section of seats, I should say. Council, oh, but Miller is there. Oh, what an inning for Billy Miller. Yeah, I suspect he's going to he's gonna hit it. Well, that might, yeah, that'll change a lot of things. Although, it appears as if we will have a, a different hitter. It is not... Angelosi, it's going to be Kurt Abbott. So that is all for Kevin Brown. But he could actually still win it if the Marlins get to another run here. He cannot lose it. So Kurt Abbott, who's been with this team for four of the five years, since coming over in a trade from Oakland at the end of the 93 season, Get some of the starts at second base. Castillo started the year at second, but he's not really ready, at least at this point, will be. And then Council won the job at Abbott. He's a good man with the bat, Ray. Oh, he, he's got a very quick bat. Dead fastball hitter. Uh, likes the ball middle of the plate in. Uh, has a little trouble with the breaking ball, but, but a lot of power for middle infielder. Born in Zanesville, Ohio. Reader in on the outside corner for a strike, one and one. Charles Johnson, they tried to run on him once, forget it, and he just tied this game up at one. What a good game this is. What good games we've had today on the SPN. Runs at a premium in the National League Divisional Series, at least today. You talk about pitching, boy. Pitching shuts down good hitting uh, just seemingly all the time, and they see both managers knowing that this is going to be what you call. How many fingernails do you have left? I got none. I, I'm, I'm a chewer. Well, first time in the postseason for Dusty Baker, for Jimmy Leland, his fourth crack at it. Dusty wins 103 games his first year in 93 and doesn't get in because the Braves win 104. And had a sniff at it for this year. Abbott right at Kent. So two line shots now in the infield, but the infielders have been positioned perfectly. And Abbott lines out, there's two out. Tomorrow, we begin with baseball tonight. 12.30 Eastern time, then the same bat time, same bat channel. Strohs and Braves at 1, Giants and Marlins here at 4. On NBC tomorrow night, Orioles and Mariners begin their series with Randy Johnson at home. And then baseball tonight at midnight. Oh, what a great week this is for a baseball fan. A lot of people may be calling in sick. You know, big baseball <laughs> fans, they got a little bit of the walking flu and the walking pneumonia and the, the boogie woogie boo, right? Johnny Rivers. It wasn't Devo that sang that song. It was Johnny Rivers as Devon White. Works the count to two and one. Devo 0 for 3, although Barry Bonds made a sliding catch to rob him of a base hit back in the third. If you're just tuning in, Chris Berman along with Ray Knight. Glad you could join us as a scoreless battle between uh, Kevin Brown and Kirk Reeder. Two home runs this inning. Leadoff man of the Giants in the seventh, Billy Miller, went deep. And the first man you saw, Charles Johnson, the catcher, let off the bottom of the seventh with a home run. Full count, two out, nobody aboard.
Inside. Oh, Devoe thought that he was drawing the base on balls, but Reeder comes back with three straight outs after Johnson ties this thing at one with a no doubter to left. One one after seven. Well, we got a 1-1 tie. In basketball, they call it court awareness. In baseball, we call it field awareness. Ray Knight talked about it, looking around to see where the fielders are. Edgar Renteria did it. And then on the line drive by Bobby Bonilla, he's going, oh, so I remember Daryl Hamilton was out there. I got to get back. Barry Bond, same thing. He's looking around, checking the defense. And then on the soft line drive by Kent, he thinks, ooh, I got to get back. Renteria is going to get it. It kept both innings alive. They didn't score, but a lot of times in close games, it's good or bad base running that's going to make the difference. Well, Dave, both Ray and I, and certainly you thought the same thing from your perch that you said it right. Two runs might be the magic number. We said that when it was scoreless. And what are those bonds at second base not moving him around? But well, we're 1-1, and Kirk Reeder is a competitor every bit as much as Kevin Brown and his reaction on coming into the dugout. Johnson. Yeah, not, not a vociferous toss, but or, or a, at least, get upset a little bit. Why not? At least he did it with his right hand. Yeah. A lot of those guys coming there firing with yeah, mm -hmm. Experience. So the Giants begin the eighth inning with 7-8-9. Vizcaino, Johnson, and perhaps a pinch hitter for Kirk Reeder. You would think so. Vizcaino has struck out both times, swinging and looking. As Dennis Short Order Cook is the new pitcher for the Florida Marlins. Very tough left handed pitcher. Is certainly not afraid to work inside, Ray. We know that much about Dennis. No, he doesn't. He likes to throw the ball inside, and that sets up that big slow hook that he has. He also has a change up that he throws that uh, also fades away from a right handed hitter, but uh, basically, fastball pitcher um, with a big, slow curveball. 63 Ks and 62 and change innings, so you know that he can punch guys out. 0 and 2 ahead of his kind. Well, he called a breaking ball, then he shook him off. He called a fastball in, he shook him off, then he called a fastball away, and he shook him off. So I don't know what he's going to throw. Let's see what he fastball away. The silver sombrero for Jose Vizcaino. Three strikeouts, two courtesy of Kevin Brown, one now for Dennis Cook. Well, he sets up outside. He gets a little bit on top of the ball, but he threw the heck out of that ball. And just like we talked about his fastball, 90 miles an hour, two strikes protecting the plate. Just can't get the head of the bat to the ball. That'll bring up the Giants catcher, Brian Johnson. So Marvin Bernard with a bat in his hand, although Glenn Allen Hill, who, of course, with one swing of his bat can easily hit a home run. He's come out of the on-deck circle to bat for the pitcher, Kirk Reeder. The pitch misses outside. Dennis Cook originally came as Glenn Allen. We'll probably get the start tomorrow against Al Leiter. Should get the start in right field. There's that one missed with 2 0. Cook actually came into the majors with the Giants in 88 and 89 and was involved in a big trade that helped the Giants nail down the National League West when he and Terry Mulholland, oddly enough, were sent to Philadelphia for the veteran stopper Steve Bedrosia. He began his tour with San Francisco. Back in the 80s, he hits a high cheese there to Johnson, strike one. Uh, Brian Johnson's a great fastball hitter. Uh, a couple years ago, uh, Dave Berber asked me, what did I think we need to do to get him out? And I said, bust him inside with a fastball. He threw one 94 miles an hour, hit a rocket off the left field wall. And busted down and away. Those balls are away from him, though. He started him off with two change-ups away and then two fastballs away. I think Brad's trying to go ahead and, and put them ahead. He's swinging a little too big right here. And Brian, excuse me. Brad's quarterback here. <laughs> yeah, pretty good one. Fastball away here. 
Johnson reaches out. Conine will get it. He'll race Johnson to the bag. Beats him and Cook to first base. Takes it himself two out. And that'll bring up the pinch hitter, Glenn Allen Hill. One thing Glenn Allen has is power, although this year only with 11 home runs, 64 RBIs. Yeah, he does have power. He hit 28 doubles. He dead red fastball hitter. You do not want to make a mistake uh, out over the plate or up with this man with a fastball because he can annihilate it. You can get him out with pitching him really tight and, and breaking balls and change-ups away, but, but he's a great fastball hitter, and Larry Rothschild's going out there to go over and make sure that Cook knows him. You know, the first chip from either pitching coach in the game, and neither of them went to visit with their start. <laughs> you don't have to go out there very much when they're putting up those zeros. And then lightning strikes, and you don't have a chance to get out there. Mm -hmm. Former Cincinnati Red pitching coach. Glenn Allen Gergich Hill. Came up with Toronto, traded to Cleveland, and went to the Cubs. Giants last couple of years were up near the Bay Area. Well, down the road a piece in Santa Cruz. Gergich. Good one. Oh. Gergich. Yeah. Let's see, I don't know anything oh, about why. Hotel California, right? I know, just Georgia boy. Georgia boy. <laughs> Strawberry Hill wine. <laughs> <on. laughs> Come on out to San Francisco with me this weekend. We'll discuss the wine list, all right? I'm not much of a wine guy. all right. Trust me. 0-1 oh, to Glen Allen Hill. Two out here in the eighth inning in a 1-1 game. Billy Miller a home run in the seventh to lead it off for the Giants. Charles Johnson a home run to lead off the bottom of the seventh for Florida. Kevin Brown for Florida. Kirk Reeder for the Giants. Masterful on the hill as were Greg Maddox and Daryl Kyle in Atlanta earlier today. Game one by the Braves over the Astros 2-1. Maddox went the route. Even though through seven innings they got only two hits off of Daryl Kyle, they did get the two runs. And Atlanta got the win. And what they hope will be a return trip to the series and a, a win in the World Series form. Giants bullpen, the hard thrower there on the right. Roberto Hernandez and William Tavares still up on the left. And Kurt Reeder, hey, he should be smiles. I know he's upset over that home run, but hey, oh. he knew. Against Kevin Brown, his team was going to get virtually nothing, and he gives him a chance to win. You you cannot get upset about giving up a home run. Here, the man pitched a great ball game, kept the team in the game. You know, with seven strong innings, you know he he's got to be happy. You know, you want to be perfect, strive for perfection, and you get excellence. And that's he was excellent today. One two count to Glenn Allen Hill. Him out. He doesn't like the call for Mark Hirschbeck. And Cook comes in and strikes out two of the three he faces. Oh, it's crunch time. Bottom of the eighth in a 1 1 game. What a ball game we have. And the little lifter, the best of five between the Giants and Marlins. 1 1 as we head to the bottom of the eighth, like an old fashioned goalies duel in hockey. Speaking of which, oh, what a Diego Siggy segue. Eric Lindros leads the Legion of Doom and the Philadelphia Flyers on opening night of the NHL here on ESPN. Tomorrow night at home against the Florida Panthers. Flyers got to the Cup Finals last year before they were done in by the Wings. They want to get back. Panthers, Flyers, 7.30 tomorrow night from Philadelphia. We got baseball playoffs. We got opening night of hockey. We got football going on. What a time of year. This is Julian Tavares, who made a giant record 89 appearances this year. On in relief with Kirk Reeder, and he faces two, three, four. Edgar Renteria, Gary Sheffield, Bobby Bonilla. Remember, Renteria and Sheffield singled and walked in the sixth inning to lead that off, but nothing was doing at that point. And Tavares quickly behind 2-0. Oh. Well, he's got a good fastball. He has a tendency to get a little wild with it, though. He's kind of a slinger. Uh, got good velocity up around 90-plus, and, and uh, throws a real tight slider. In there for his first strike. Attendance today of 42,167. They've beefed up some seats. So for the playoffs, the divisional playoffs, they could sell 44,686. So just a couple thousand shy of a sellout here in Miami. 
Three and one, and this is not what Dusty Baker had in mind to bring in a reliever to get behind your first hitter. They opened some of the seats up, but of course they put that over. That's all the seats for the Dolphins do. And they put the blue on, so the seats, the orange sheet seats don't shine in the batter's eye. The big game. Blue flare to right field. Javier coming over. It holds up for him. And Renteria is out. Our Wrangler Jeans pitching summary. And his pitching matchup was tighter than the Wrangler Jeans. Both Reeder and Kevin Brown, almost identical line. Seven innings pitch. Give up four hits each, a solo home run. Reader walked three. Brown did not, but almost identical lines, Ray, and what a great job by guys going out in a pressure situation. Well, it's exactly what we expected, and the runs were scored by two home runs. There, there hasn't been really any little ball play, no real bunts, uh, no hit and runs, uh, just two blasts and, and two great pitching performances. Here's a man that could change things drastically with one swing of his bat, Gary Sheffield. He thought it was inside, but Hirschbeck called it a strike. Well, people should pitch him inside hard, and here comes a pitch moving way in, and, and I think the ball started enough on the plate over that side made ways movement. It ended up real tight to him. Came a little bit farther in with a fastball. Missed that time. It's one and one. I tell you, you better not fool with him too much in there, though. I, I guarantee you he can turn it around as well as anybody in the game. No, we saw him in that game. We did in the bottom of the ninth against the Orioles with a home run to left. And look at this, a shot to left field. Back goes Bonds, he leaps, hits off the wall. Bounds in front of him, Sheffield to second. Bonds overruns it, but Gary will hold there. Boy, that ball had hair on it for a double. Man, his bat just flies through the strike zone. I, I said before about him and, and Bonds having the fastest bats in the National League. You can talk about the walkers and everything, but a fast bat's a man that just throws ahead. Watch this right here. He tries to come in again, gets the ball a little bit out over the plate, and that ball was a rocket. I mean a rocket. Never got over 10, 12 feet high, seemingly. Uh, obviously, there it's higher, but that was just a peak, man. That'll bring the crowd of 42,000 plus to its feet. For Bobby Bonilla, now against the right-handed DeVarence, about a left-hander for the first time this afternoon. They're going to walk him. Do you like this? Oh, yeah, I like it. Definitely, I like it. I like it. Anytime you can get a uh, double play situation and only get make one pitch and get two outs, I'd do it. Uh, a lose on deck. He swung at the first pitch the last two times. He's certainly a clutch hitter with over 100 RBIs, but no way do I pitch the knee with first base open and, and double play opportunities setting up. And Benilla is a guy that doesn't speed around the bases, a, a good guy they could double. I don't know what the Giants are thinking, but the Florida Marlins are thinking, hey, we got two on. We just went out, and one of our best hitters, Moises Alou, is up. Jimmy Leland knows that Alou got up to a fast start this year. Then in only one home run from like mid-April to late July, but had he not had that dry spell, his 23 home run total and 115 RBIs would have been a lot higher. And Dusty Baker will bring all hands into the mound. Dusty just going out there to settle him down, uh, bullet off the left field wall, and then you walk a guy. Uh, sometimes when you walk a man, you don't have that concentration. You just throw the ball up there, and he's just going out there to settle him down. Uh, he does this as well as any manager in the league. I think that. Um, second only to me when I was managing. Uh, he, he goes to the mound often. And, and I mean, rather than the pitching coach. Rather than pitching coach. Now, Tavares, of course, no stranger to the postseason. In his last couple of years with the Cleveland Indians, five appearances in the divisional series, four in championship round in 95, and five in the World Series. So he's, this is his 15th postseason appearance. Sheffield at second. Bonilla first. One out. Moises Alou is fly to each outfield position. Center, left, and right. 1-1. One, one. Bottom of the eighth. Miller a homer in the seventh. Johnson a homer in the seventh. Charles Johnson for Florida. And Dusty doesn't have a left-hander getting loose in the bullpen in case Dalton's ready to pinch it for Conine. Wow, 
from here on in, it's going to be Hernandez or Beck. I don't think he's going to toy with a lefty in this situation this late. Hernandez is up. Right-hander, smoke throw. If it's football, I guess they, they uh, it's a five-yard penalty for delay a game, not getting the snap off, huh? <laughs> you call it here in baseball. The wheels are, the stomach is churning, really, for Leland and Baker. Off-speed pitch misses inside, ball one. And he hung that. He's tried to throw him a slider, got way under the ball, ball hung inside. You grip the ball a little bit tighter in situations like this, and you have a tendency to not be able to put that tight spin on it, and that ball hung inside. Fastball farther inside, 2-0. So Tavares has come in and had control problem. Well, he's just trying to overthrow Chris. Um, you know, when, when you start hanging pitches, it's, it's because you, you, you're you overthrowing. He overthrew that ball right there. Just has to take a big breath and stay behind the baseball and then make a good pitch. Inside again, and Alou trying to sit on it. Chop and foul. Jeff Conine in the on-deck circle. Where do they go and, as you suggest, look at Darren Dalton? They're looking at Moises Alou right now. A little base knock will give the Marlins a lead. And Robbie Nen, the closer, starting to limber. Ground ball, Miller. Kent. Snow. Turn on the button. The strategy by Dusty Baker pays off, and another fine play by Billy Miller. Let's bite some more nails and go to the ninth. <laughs> the runs and base runners have been a premium, so we haven't seen a double dip turn. But Billy Miller starts on a tough play, Ray. Boy, he stays down in front of that ball and uh, puts his belt buckle right in the center of the ball, goes down on both knees and, and turns. And oh, Dusty. There's one. And there's two. You know, that so many times, I know Don Mailer got on me one time last year about emotion, but I like emotion. Man, you, you see people like that, and, and uh, Tommy Lasorda and him, and uh, remember Chuck Tanner? I like to see managers with emotion. He certainly has. Coxie shows a little emotion, doesn't he? Oh, well, yeah. yeah. He does. Yeah, he does. Top of the order, Daryl Hamilton, Billy Miller, who has been the giant star along with Reader. And Barry Bonds. Looking ahead to Florida's ninth, Conine Johnson Council. Now the Giants said, boy, if we could come in here and somehow get a split. Of course, you want to win every game, but we can get a split. Phil will have stolen one going back home because they know the Marlins have the best home record in the major leagues. 52 wins, 29 losses here. Better than anybody in either league. Jimmy Leland elects to go with Cook again. Marlins better than the Braves, better than the Mets. The Giants won 48 at home, and we're going to have, if we go to four games, at least one night game, and that'll be about 40 degrees cooler than it is now, Ray. That would be Saturday night if it goes to four games. And you'd see that game here a late tilt Saturday night on ESPN. You pack your candlestick sweater. I did. Good move. Two and two to Daryl Hamilton. Charles Johnson gives the sign. We'll do it again. Oh, 
And the familiar sight in the ninth inning for the Giants of Rod Beck. The thing I like most about Beck is, well, he's easygoing and great to talk to, but he looks like a reliever. Right? Well, he, he does. Reminds me of Dick Tidrow. Mm hmm. Well, Dick is with the assistant GM with the Giants. I think he's, his mustache is a little. Ah, Tidrow had a pretty good mustache then, Vinny. Big fool. Count is full of three and two. Barry Bonds. Drew up third. Studying Dennis Cook intently. Oh, Hamilton thought he had a ball four, but instead it's strike three. Three out of the four batters. Cook is faced. He is struck out. It's just a real good pitch. The ball goes right into the glove, and Charles Johnson again frames it. You can't look where he catches the ball. That ball's a little bit of a cutter. Uh, and, and the ball catches a little part of the plate and sails off the plate. So too close to take. Billy Miller, switch hitter, will turn around and hit from the right side against Dennis Cook. And you look at the spelling, you will in a minute, the giant fans from old days in New York. If you haven't seen this club much this year, we'll talk about it in a minute as Miller... Now it's curving away from everyone down the right field line. A long run and a dive by Sheffield, and he couldn't get it. Nice effort by Gary. Gives a chance to tell the story that way back when in the 50s when the Giants played in New York. And a nice hand for Sheffield. He makes a long run here. People talk about Sheffield not playing hard. I've seen him play hard his whole career when it matters. Sometimes he doesn't run balls back. Uh, hard that he hits the ball back to the pitcher or the sh shortstop or second baseman, but I think the man plays hard. At any rate, way back in the 50s, the Giants had a very good hitter by the name of Don Mueller, spelled the same, pronounced differently than Billy's name. He was a key in that famous rally, the Miracle at Coogan Bluff. Got on base, was doubled to third by Whitey Lockman, the playoff game against the Dodgers as. Bill Miller looks at ball one. Broke his ankle on the play. Clint Hartung went into pinch run. Bobby Thompson hit the home run. But Don Mueller spelled the same way. Here we are almost half a century later, and there's another an unusual name and wearing giant colors again. Foul back. Conine and Johnson will give it a run to the dugout. Two rows deep. Batting from the left side to lead off the seventh inning against Kevin Brown. Brown just gets the ball out over the plate. Mueller, see him hustle there. When you don't hit very many and you only hit, like you said, seven, you run them all out. You should run them out. <laughs> you run them all out. You know, a lot of these guys like Barry, he does that little whirl and, and uh, you know, but when you don't hit many of them, you don't know when they're gone. Yeah, but he's a scrapper anyway. Yes, he runs he everything out anyway. Barry Bonds, the imposing figure. 25 is on deck. Count is one and two. Dennis Cook taking strike out again. Boy, he's been impressive. Right. Goodbye. Skies it. Two down. Council makes the play on the outfield grass. Well, here you go. Barry Bonds, ninth inning, 1-1 game, playoffs. Barry is one for three. He doubled off Kevin Brown in the seventh inning. But against Cook, lifetime. 0-9. It doesn't matter. You can throw that stuff out the window. I'm telling you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Although I know that Jimmy Leland... That was part of his decision to keep Cook in for a second inning, right? With Bonds coming up third. Leland certainly didn't throw that stuff out the window. No. Bonds with 40 home runs this year. Again, the shift is on. Three infielders to the right of second base. As you describe it, the Ted Williams shift. Cook in there for a strike. You know, when you see a, um, a stat like 0 for 9, there's a hole you see uh, all to the left side, but... You can bet Barry, although he drove the ball that way last time, he'll pull the ball if it's in his wheelhouse. They're setting up outside. 
pitches way outside. Ball one, one and one. Of course, the outfielders are straight away, Ray. Yeah, Barry doesn't hit very many balls on the ground to the third base side, so that's why you see this shift. He hits a ball on the ground, he usually pulls it, so they're not giving up a lot here by moving that way because if he hits the ball the other way, it'll be in the air. Hits the outside corner, strength two. Usually when you see a stat like that, 0 for 9 with a great hitter like Barry, it's, uh, it's a stat waiting to be corrected. Here's just a blitz and fastball, and Mark Kerspeck has called this pitch all night long. All these pitchers tonight have had depth control. They've been able to put that ball right there, that spot. And you mentioned Charles Johnson's ability to get a call for a strike. One-two pitch from Dennis Cook. I'm just thinking, you know, Barry came in with an awful mark against Kevin Brown. He says, hey, I doubled off this guy. I saw that. Now you give me a guy I'm 0-9 against? Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> two balls, two strikes, two outs, 1-1 one, one game, top of the ninth. Doesn't get much better than this. Well, maybe a little bit better. We can go full count to Barry Bonds. Well, he has a great eye, and he was talking about his dad. There you see his postseason uh, 21 games, only 197, one home run. That's, that's almost shocking. Well, says everything's new this year. The Giants fans certainly are hopeful. So is he. Gets under it. But this will be interesting, but it does carry enough to Moises Alou. It went up high enough. Remember, there's no infielders back there to chase the ball. But Alou makes the grab. Bonds is going to be headed to the bottom of the line. The Marlins try to win it in their last at back. Way. In Florida, it's been hot. It's been tense. It's been close. It's been exciting. It's been frustrating. There have been heroes. Who will be the ultimate hero? Game one of the Marlins and Giants. A crowd now of 42,000 plus. Now they're geared up as one of their original Marlins. Jeff Conine has a chance to be a hero against Julian Tavares. Conine won an All-Star game a couple of years ago with a home run. And sure did. Off of, uh, that was Steve Onoveros of Oakland, I believe. He was a hero then. He'll be a hero here. Bill Miller guarding the line at third. Snow guarding the line at first. Here we go in the bottom of the ninth. And the Florida Marlins have done this better than anyone else in baseball. They're tied for the most wins in their last at bat. 24. This would technically, if they win it, count as a comeback win because they did trail 1-0. So as we told you at the beginning, both the Giants and Marlins are used to games like this. Use the situations like this, and they excel in situations like this. Jimmy checking out his stat sheet there and his matchup sheet. He knows Conine ahead of Tavares 2-0. Oh. Ooh, when he goes down and swings the one that might have been out of the strike zone. Good low ball hitter, though. He likes the ball down. Jeff Conine likes the ball down. And there's a ball that he's looking down on, and Good you see he's got a little bit of uppercut. But he's a good low ball hitter for a right-handed hitter. That was a strike. Looked like a strike anyway. Count is two and one to Conine. Smells that one backward two and two. Conine, Charles Johnson, Craig Council. Although Kevin Brown, who we told you, nail biting time. All right, Jimmy Leland has his pick of several hitters. Darren Dalton. If they go lefty, Jim Eisenreich, a right-handed hitter, very dangerous. Jimmy's got a deep bench in this situation. Foul. J.T. Snow will give it a run. It's out of play. Leland looking. Well, he knows who he has on his roster, but there's Jim Eisenreich. Remember those 93 Phillies along with Dutch Dalton, one of the most enjoyable teams that we've seen in recent years. Dutch Dalton with the bat. Well, he'll use Dalton if it's a, a bang situation. He'll use Eisenreich. This is a situation where 
he uh, he needs to right, drive and run, and he'll use Cangelosi if it's a guy that he doesn't care about the right or left-handed situation. He'll use him up there as a pinch hitter because he's switch hitter. And he maybe can draw a walk. As Leland says, he's about three foot two. That's why I sent him <laughs> up to the plate a lot. Pinch hit situation. An interesting thing here, I just noticed that uh, Conan has 13 home runs this year against right-handed pitchers. Ripped where Miller would have normally been, but he was guarding the line, and so the Marlins have the potential winning run aboard here in the bottom of the ninth. I mean, you got to play that way if you're Miller, but it's right where he would have normally been stationed. Well, I don't know if you have to play that way or not. I, I, I like the situation, especially if you have speed on the bench that can steal a base where you play straight away with nobody out. He's guarding the line. The ball's hit sharply to his left. That would be right dead at him. What I like to do is see you shade the line in that situation a lot deeper, and then you've got more lateral movement. But managers differ on that. I know Sparky always believed in playing the line. Davy Johnson off the line. It's just all what you believe. Charles Johnson, homer to lead off the seventh, and he's showing bunt. Snow creeping in. That pitch, did it hit him? Yes, it yeah. did. Oh, boy, Tavares tried to cross up Johnson, say, try and bunt this, and he hit him. Well, you've got a great bunter now in council coming up. You're going to have runners in first and second. The ball is just way inside, almost at his chest, and he made an attempt to get out of the way, did not attempt to bunt the ball, and he hits him on his elbow or his wrist. But watch how he brings the bat back. So it's not an attempt. It hits him right up against his shirt. Good call. So now Dusty Baker to the hill. If you think he's bunting, you would think Tavares quicker off the mound than a Roberto Hernandez, wouldn't you? Well, in this situation, you bring in the guy that's the best fielding player you have. You know they're going to bunt. They're not going to try to trick you. So he's going to leave the best pitcher out there that feels a bunt. It's going to be the smoke throwing Roberto Hernandez to try. Chris Berman, Ray Knight, Dave Campbell with you here. 1 1, bottom of the ninth inning, and the Marlins have two on and none out. Sports Center with Bob Lee, Robin Roberts, Jack Edwards. Boy, we turn out the big time for these playoff sports centers. Standing by when we end here. Roberto Hernandez, who can top off at 98 miles an hour, will come on to pitch to Craig Council. Yeah, and you have the situation again here. Is Dusty Baker going to call the wheel play where the shortstop covers third base? Second baseman vacates. Is he going to go with the straight bunt where the pitcher covers third base and the third baseman stays at home? You can bet Council is going to be butting here. And if they do vacate, will Jimmy Leland have him slug bunt or butcher boy? That means swing the bat when they vacate short and second. And then to further that, if they do get the runners over to second and third, he's going to pinch hit eyes and right, and they're probably going to walk in. So. To, to face Devo. So, yes, the wheels are turning a they're bit turning. faster at this point. Yes, they are. Council has been aboard two of his three times. He's walked, he's singled, and he's lined out to Billy Miller. So he has been scrappy in that eight hole. Bunt pops it. Miller <laughs> almost as far enough for him to make a dive for it. You know, again, the Marlins having trouble putting that bunt down right. Yeah, they really do. And, and we talked about the small things early in the game, and uh, Soup has talked about the, the importance of this. Council squares around, has his bat up, and again, just drops the head of his bat down. you got to stay on top of the ball. Just think about it. If you drop the bat barrel down, you're going to go to the bottom of the baseball. Strike two, and that changes some things. 0 and 2, Hernandez ahead of Council. I don't, I don't know if it does. I don't know if it changes anything. I think you still got a bunt here. This ball is just a 97 mile an hour cheese ball right there around the knees, maybe a tad low, but it was a good fit. I think he's probably going to still have him bunting here. I would not be surprised. Certainly don't want to hit into a double play when you're down 0 and 2. Took the bunt inside, one and two. J.T. Snow really charging at first base. I mean, he's vacating in a hurry. And he's just leaving his position a lot like Keith Hernandez. Keith Hernandez used to feel the ball on the third base side and make a play at third base. J.T. just vacating and right on top of it. Ball gets behind Brian Johnson, but Conine stays at second. 
Well, here's a situation with Conine at, at being their best defensive first baseman. Uh, Jimmy Leland chooses not to pinch run uh, a guy at second base. Uh, it's one thing that Tony Russa does. Uh, always uses a, a pinch runner in the situation at second base because uh, just a poor bunt with good speed at second, you can beat that throw to third base. So uh, he's he's rolling the dice. Doesn't have anybody over there that he feels a better runner. As you suggested, Jim Eisenreich in the on-deck circle, a dead red hitter, a fastball hitter. Hernandez certainly a fastball pitcher. Bunt it. It's a good one. Miller. Oh, Kent makes the play. Miller almost threw it away. The council with two strikes does his job, and the winning run is 90 feet away from the plate. Well, that's a great job by council getting a two-pitch, two-strike bunt down. Great job right here. Just a tremendous job. Keeps his back barrel level. Deads the ball there. Miller comes up and with that wet ball almost throws it away. See, I knew that was going to happen. Marlon safe, safe. Yeah, no. <laughs> Not quite. Wasn't safe, but he almost got around the home. Dusty Baker, Dick Paul, the pitching coach. Jim Eisenreich. Infield in, obviously, with Conine at third and Johnson at second. And as you suggested, Ray, the manager that you are, several steps <laughs> along with these guys. Used to be. <laughs> <laughs> the intentional pass to Eisenreich, which will bring up Devon White with the bases loaded and one out. And it's going to be another interesting situation here because can you turn a double play on Devon White if your infield is at normal double play depth at second and short? I want to see how Dusty's going to play this. If he's going to play the infield halfway to come home to first, or if he's going to play them in normal double play depth, thinking that they can double play to Devon White. Ron Karanowski, the, brand, the Giants brain trust, talking how would you play it? Right? I'd play it in. I, you got to make the play at home. Oh, they are. They're not moving back off the grass. No, Devo runs too well. White is 0 for 4, although he was robbed by a sliding catch of Barry Bonds in the third. But Conine, the potential winning run at third. Charles Johnson at second. Jim Eisenreich at first with one out, 1-1, one, one, bottom nine. And the outfield is way in. They're, Barry Bonds is only about 200 feet from home plate in left field. You have to be in here. You have to be able to throw the man out. Devon White has excelled in postseasons before. He looks at ball one from Roberto Hernandez. That'll be foul, one and one. Well, Dusty's just hoping for a punch out right here. He's got the guy to do it. Yep. think you can think squeeze with bases loading the guy with this kind of stuff so you're just gonna have to drive him in strike that was high and in but oh man that was some serious heat that's some gas there's no way that he can get the head out on this ball because what he's trying to do is make contact and not roll over the ball so you stay inside the ball he crowds him you can't get the bat barrel above that uh, underneath that ball one and two the count. Little chopper. They come home to Kent. They do not try the double play, but Conine is out at the plate. The infield in works. The Marlins still have bases loaded and two out now for Renteria. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Just a great pitch by Hernandez there. A real good fastball just down. Actually, a split finger. Do you see that tumble of that ball? Split finger gets wide out front. Jeff Kitt makes a good play. Make sure of one. Edgar Renteria, 0 for 4, has impressed in the field. Boy, Kent's made two good plays this inning. He saved that ball from Miller from sailing on. Yes, he did. Eight. Charles Johnson at third, Eisenreich at second, Devon White at first. 
Miller in it, even with the bag, just in case Renteria wants to drop one. Little low ball one. Boy, you think to the Giants, that huge game they had against the Dodgers, and the bases were loaded, and none was out, and they got a strikeout. Rod Beck got a double play to Eddie Murray. Again, now we move forward to the bases loaded with one out. Can Hernandez wriggle free here in game one of the playoffs? Outside, 2-0. And Boomer Renneria has six game-winning hits in their last at bat this year, so this kid has delivered a lot in this situation. I think he has to take a strike, though. You know, a walk's as good as a hit. You've heard that. You know, I, I, would, I would not swing at this pitch. I don't care where it is. I'm taking a strike. Hernandez and Johnson want to get their signal straight. Now at the All-Star break, neither was a member of the Giants. Hernandez pitching for the White Sox, Johnson playing for the Tigers. Here they are discussing how do we get out of this thing in the National League Divisional Series. Taken all the way, two and one. That was borderline pitch yeah, high. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That ball was borderline high right there. Watch this ball. Usually the catcher's mask is it, and the ball is right there at his mask, so right there borderline. Anything above that's a ball. Little flare. That'll do it. Johnson scores. The Marlins on the field. They've won it two to one. For the 25th time this year, the Florida Marlins have won in their final at bat. Their first ever postseason game is a scintillating one. As they win it in the bottom of the ninth, two to one. And you pointed out Edgar Renteria making Billy Marlin play at the flag. Boy, he really did. Man, 20 years old, just well beyond his years of maturity. Time literally and figuratively here in South Florida as Renneria sends a flare that finds the hole between first and second, and that was it. Fastball right down the middle, inside out, base hit. So the Florida Marlins. Get the win in the bottom of the ninth inning. For Dennis Cook, Roberto Hernandez could not nail it down, and Tavares gets the loss. The Marlins beat the Giants 2-1. We'll do it again at 4 o'clock tomorrow. Boy, was this fun. First Sports Center coming up with Bob Lee and Robin Roberts and Jack Edwards. Doubleheader tomorrow again here on ESPN. The Braves and the Strohs at one. The Giants and the Marlins at four. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. For Dave Campbell and Ray Knight, I'm Chris Berman. Welcome to the postseason. The Marlins two, the Giants.